Okay, I believe our live stream is set up. I will uh, start our recording and uh, we're good. Great, thank you. Um, I'm very pleased to, to be here. For those who don't know me, I'm Joel Molina. I'm Vice President for University Relations at Cornell. I've got other uh, members of the Cornell team here as well to help us answer any questions you may have. Um, I hope to just spend a few minutes uh, with a brief update on where we are with the uh, uh, start of our spring semester. Um, we you, have begun. Oh, just, sorry, Please. forgive me for interrupting. Just a note for the, the viewing public at home, thank you for your patience as we work through some technical difficulties. If you are tuning in to watch the J. Diane Sams Award, you have not missed it. Uh, we will be doing it after the update and presentation from Cornell. So sorry, uh, uh, Vice President. Uh, right. thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so we've begun uh, what worked quite well last semester in terms of our uh, engagement with uh, municipalities and with the general public. Um, last week, we had our first, again, in 2021, of what will be monthly general public town halls. The schedule for that is available on our community relations website, or you can email Gary Stewart or his team. And uh, similar to what we're doing tonight, we're going to be making the rounds to other uh, municipal uh, governing bodies. I think we have the town of Ithaca coming up next. Um, we are uh, about two-thirds of the way through a, uh, a complicated but so far successful move-in process. The Spring semester begins uh, next week with the start of classes, and we have uh, sequenced uh, an uh, ongoing uh, move-in process that began, oh, about 10 days ago. Uh, as we all know, the virus uh, today is different than it was when our last semester ended, um, but the attention that we're providing to our aggressive surveillance testing program uh, continues to be uh, uh, quite uh, finely focused. Um, we um, are requiring all of our returning students uh, to go through arrival testing. So this is in addition to all required travel and quarantine guidance from New York State. Um, students upon arrival are tested on day one and then again on day five. And only once they come back with those two negatives are they moved into their regular scheduled surveillance testing. For those of our students who've been here for the duration of our break, they have continued with their regular schedule of surveillance testing. That has not paused at all. Um, our approach, similar to last semester, is grounded in science. Um, our team of modelers, uh, led by Peter Fraser, uh, have updated their modeling, which continues to guide our approach. It does show that transmission of the virus, again, can be controlled and that an in-person semester is the safest option, as it was last semester, uh, for students to return uh, again, with that aggressive testing in place. Um, we didn't want to rest on the laurels from last semester. We have ongoing, on an ongoing basis, analyzed and uh, looked at how we might improve to enhance, to make adjustments. I'll touch on just a few of those adjustments, uh, and then I would love to open it up to your questions. Um, we wanted faster turnaround on test results, and we've achieved that. Um, just by way of example, I'll talk about my own testing. Last semester, it was usually 24 to 48 hours after which the results would appear on my patient portal. I was tested again yesterday. In seven hours, those results were back. This again is an effort to ensure uh, as quickly as possible, identifying, isolating, contact tracing, adaptive tracing as necessary to identify the virus and to contain it as quickly as possible. So faster turnaround on test results. Number two, importantly, more frequent testing. Now we had a very aggressive schedule last year, undergraduates twice a week, um, and then others depending on their uh, uh, efforts in terms of being with undergraduates either twice a week, once a week, or as my cycle has been once every two weeks. But for some students, and it's those who are spending significant time in groups, so we're talking about athletes, members of Greek life, those living in our co-ops or other community living arrangements, they are being tested now three times a week. This was informed by our modeling. Uh, also importantly, our students are gonna have to take one of their surveillance tests each week on either Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. This is a not so subtle way to further uh, disincentivize travel. We did find an overwhelming uh, number of positives tied to those students who did leave Ithaca, 
contracted the virus and brought it back to campus. Now we were able to contain it, which was great, but we want to limit uh, as much of that travel-based uh, transmission as possible. Uh, I've talked a lot about students. Clearly we're focusing a lot as well as providing enhanced support to all of our employees. Um, we are very appreciative of what continues to be um, a very trying time for all of us, especially those who are engaging with our students, whether it be in dining, residence halls, our terrific utilities uh, and, uh, and, uh, and staffs that are working on our facilities. Uh, and of course, our faculty who are continuing to uh, come up with great uh, innovative ways for in-person uh, virtual and hybrid instruction. So let me stop there. We are happy to answer questions on any COVID related or frankly non-COVID related issue that might be uh, on your mind. I am respectful of your full agenda. So whatever time you'd like to spend, we're here to help. Thank you, Joel. We appreciate that. Any, any questions for um, Joel or Gary, Charlie, uh, uh, anyone from the university? Cool list. Yes, Graham. Thank you, Joel. Um, and good to see all the uh, Cornell representatives here. So I've had a couple of residents asked about what kind of fraction of the student body is is returning to uh, for the spring semester. Do you do you have any sense of the numbers that are uh, yes. coming back? Yeah, out of our uh, maximum, our, our, our pre-COVID numbers of about 23,000 undergraduate and graduate students, we're expecting 19,000 and change. So that's a larger number than last semester, which I think reflects the fact of a, of a heightened confidence in Cornell's approach. But we also recognize because of the progression of the virus, there are families and students who are still uh, hesitant uh, about, uh, about returning. So again, 19,000 and change. Thank you. Yes, George. Sorry, mute, George, you muted. Sorry, uh, Joel, will Cornell and the Ivy League have spring sports this year? Oh, great question. I don't believe that has been decided. President Pollock certainly meets regularly with the other Ivy League presidents. Uh, so that will be a decision that they will uh, decide and will announce. Uh, I have no idea on the timetable. I don't know. Karen Brown, who's with Student and Campus Life, where athletics reports up to, is on the call. I don't know, Karen, whether you have any insight into that timing. We spoke about it a little bit more today um, in some SCL team meetings, and I believe that a decision on spring sports is imminent. So it's coming within days. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia. Yes, thank you for the presentation. Do you mind, um, since we are here, taking a moment to reiterate what the processes will be in terms of monitoring uh, student behavior, uh, what an individual should do if they uh, observe something that's concerning and would like to report it. Sure, thank you, Cynthia. Um, I'll give a, a broad outline and then maybe Karen can fill in the blanks. One of the core uh, elements of our success last semester was the behavioral compact that every student needed to sign in order to register, in order to actually be on campus. Uh, and that compact remains uh, in force. It has a number of requirements, especially around expectations for behavior. Uh, we did have a, uh, a very uh, robust and successful um, uh, group of uh, both students and uh, employees uh, that were involved in a uh, task force that would uh, roam uh, the streets on the weekends and the evenings, uh, be available for peer-to-peer -peer, uh, encouragement to adhere to that compact. And I believe, Karen, we still have a dedicated email address where any member of the public uh, can uh, utilize it to uh, uh, offer observations, uh, which would certainly enable our uh, team uh, to be able to follow up uh, on any and all uh, complaints. Karen, anything you would add? Uh, that we're still moving in um, some undergraduate students over the next several days, as you can imagine, their travel has been disrupted just a little bit. So we have about 900 students coming tomorrow. And um, the behavioral compact monitors will be out in force to help just to reinforce the whole um, 
the basic requirements, the basic guidelines of six foot distancing and mask wearing and, and trying to do that. We also have that peer ambassador group out in force this week as well. And uh, what we can do, and, and I don't know if we have readily the, uh, that uh, dedicated uh, email address, but uh, we can get that through uh, Gary out to members of the Common Council. On the COVID site. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we greatly appreciate you taking the time to, to do this update. Uh, and I know you're doing it for other municipalities as well. And kudos, last year, the university's choice to open was a difficult one. And the decision to invest, frankly, heavily, heavily, millions and millions of dollars to do a state-of-the-art testing uh, um, for all your students, your staff, your faculty made all the difference. I mean, it, it made it possible for um, the students to return and our economy to begin to recover. So we appreciate it and uh, we appreciate these continued updates. So we'll be in touch with you soon. Thank you, Karen, uh, Joel. Gary. Thank you all very much. And uh, we'll be here as needed. So don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Now that we are uh, live and um, being broadcast, I'll ask, are there any other changes or additions, deletions to the agenda? Yes, Deb? Yeah, we just have a couple clarifications. So I don't know if you noticed, but in the list of consent agenda items, 3.4 was not on the list but it is actually in the agenda packet. So I just wanted everybody to be clear that when we move consent agenda, it will also include that 3.4, which is just the um, appointment of our people to the broadband um, greater uh, countywide committee. And then Shelly, did we figure out what we can do with the FSA? Do we have to pull that or do we, can we just switch it as a clerical error? Uh, or Ari? It, yeah, because it's not a resol because it's not a local law and just a resolution, you're welcome to amend it on the floor. You would just need to pull it from the consent agenda. Pull it from consent. Okay. So let's pull. Uh, is it 3.1, Shelly? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we have to pull 3.1 just because there's a number in it that's wrong. And I guess you'll then want to assign it to somewhere on the regular. Let's state. just make it. Four point. What's easier? Four point. I don't know. Whatever. Wherever you. We'll shove it into CA as four point one, and then we'll renumber the rest. We'll do that first. CA. Sounds good. Thank you. I think that's it. Great. Great. Well, um, then welcome everybody to uh, the official informal for for the last fourteen years of of my life. Black History Month does not start until the J. Diane Sands Award is given at the February meeting of Common Council. I want to recognize the committee, uh, most particularly J.R. Claiborne, for, for that entire 14 years. J.R. has been the point person on uh, making sure that this award goes off smoothly, as well as uh, uh, Diane's family, including Jack and JB, who's here with us tonight. I want to turn the floor over to our members of council who will move the resolution. And, uh, and then we have a few folks who would like to speak, including our, our most deserving award winner this month. So would anyone like to move the resolution? Cynthia. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the resolution is the J. Diane Sam's annual African-American History Month recognition honoring Mr. Kirby Edmonds and Ms. Laura Branca. Whereas since 2004, the City of Ithaca Common Council has recognized an individual in our community of great esteem and stellar leadership during African American History Month, and in so doing established a tradition of honoring outstanding leadership, courage against unspeakable odds, and an unwavering commitment to community that is in keeping with the vision of Dr. Carter G. Woodson, founder of Black African American History Month. And whereas the late elder person J. Diane Sams was a heralded civil rights leader, longtime public servant, and the first African American woman who was also a person with a disability to serve on Common Council, including as the first Black woman to serve as acting mayor, 
And whereas Common Council first bestowed this honor in 2004 on Alderperson Sams following her retirement after representing the second ward and the city's populace for a decade. And whereas Common Council renamed this annual recognition posthumously in 2007 in, on, in honor of Alderperson Sams for her tireless efforts on behalf of people of color, the underrepresented and other marginalized populations in and around Ithaca, while as a single parent raising two sons who later established careers in law enforcement. And whereas since 2004, outstanding leaders across the greater Ithaca area have received this recognition from Common Council as being, quote, a person who advocates for social justice and change, racial equity and fairness in the judicial and educational systems, while also demonstrating a willingness to speak out publicly on behalf of the aforementioned objectives, unquote. And whereas the names of each of these recipients are emblazoned on a plaque affixed in the Common Council Chambers and included with each year's resolution, which lists, sets forth a standard of excellence for this recognition beginning in 2005 with Dr. James E. Turner, Professor Emeritus, world-renowned scholar and founding director of the Africana Studies and Research Center at Cornell University. In 2006, Mr. Cal Walker, community advocate, visionary leader with the vi village at Ithaca, foster parent with his wife, Glenda Walker to scores of children across the greater Ithaca area and former chairman of the community campaign for the United Way of Tompkins County. And in 2007, the late Mrs. Frances Eastman, a pioneer in her own right as the first woman of color, supervisor of medical records at the former Tompkins County Hospital, cherished community elder and Tompkins County Senior Citizen of the Year. And whereas Dr. Woodson's lifelong devotion to educating African-Americans about their own culture and history as part of the US history led to the modern day month-long observance of Black or African-American History Month that highlights the positive impact people such as this awards recipients have had on society. And whereas two individuals who have made such an indelible stamp upon Ithaca's history and are so revered that they are worthy of community acknowledgement are Mr. Kirby V. Edmonds, posthumously, and Ms. Laura W. Branca, the change agents so committed to building a better tomorrow that they focus their consulting firm, Training for Change Associates, on helping corporations, governments, nonprofit organizations, and other groups build alliances, handle conflict, dismantle exclusive practices and bridge differences. And whereas for nearly 40 years, this power team served as community mediators through the Community Dispute Resolution Center and beyond, facilitated community dialogues even during the most tense of times, including that which led to the creation of the community leaders of color and pioneered Ithaca's talking circles on race and racism. For the Multicultural Resource Center, bringing together diverse audiences to hold respectful but frank dialogues that forged newer understandings and helped participants embrace other cultures, then teaching those participants how to teach others. And whereas among other accomplishments, Kirby and Laura, the names by which they have been most known and referred, worked with other community leaders in forming the Dorothy Cotton Institute, which helps promote the legacy of nonviolent direct action championed by the late Dr. Cotton, who formerly led the citizen education program and worked in partnership with the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And whereas through DCI, Kirby and Laura and Dr. Cotton joined a delegation of nearly two dozen civil and human rights activists and scholars who joined, who journeyed to Israel Palestine to meet with Palestinians and their Israeli allies, nonviolently resisting the occupation in the Rust Bank. And whereas Kirby, who passed away in August 2020, was known for quietly inserting himself into situations where he could work with others to further a vision of human dignity, justice, and freedom for all, as witnessed when he mediated a volatile land use dispute in Ghana for World Vision with his role as senior fellow with DCI, in his work with indigenous people in the Northwest Territories, and his co-founding of Human Rights Educators USA. 
And whereas Kirby was known as a builder of movements, he also took on other mantles, contributor, connector, designated leader, and encourager of others to plan actions that would get more power and resources into people's hands as seen locally with his help spearheading the creation of Building Bridges, the collective impact initiative to promote a socially just, ecologically sound, sustainable economy in the Tompkins County region. His facilitating skills deployed during the development of the City of Ithaca's comprehensive plan and his involvement during the current pandemic, despite declining health, with helping distribute news and information regarding local relief efforts among any, many other initiatives he aided. And whereas Laura, also a senior fellow with DCI, has involved herself in additional endeavors, including Ithaca City School District's Equity Inclusion Leadership Council, activists committing to interrupting oppression now, leading studying circles and civil conversations about racism and other compelling issues of oppression and conflict, and a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative with Cuga Health Systems. And whereas, in another way of feeding the soul, Laura also co-authored 11 famed Moosewood restaurant cookbooks and as a co-owner of Moosewood Inc. and its internationally known Moosewood restaurant, which has a 48 year history of supporting community service efforts for nutrition, health, education, social justice, and the arts. And whereas in considering the nomination of Dr. Edmonds and Ms. Branca, the panel of past recipients of this award noted, quote, Laura and Kirby have been consistent over time to the point where we look forward to their guidance on issues involving human rights and social justice, unquote. Now, therefore be it resolved that the City of Ithaca Common Council bestows upon Mr. Kirby V. Edmonds posthumously and Ms. Laura W. Branca, the 2021 J. Diane Sams African-American History Month recognition during this February and urges all citizens to recognize the invaluable contributions of these positive, affirming, and dedicated citizens who are also stalwart examples of the many prominent figures we celebrate throughout history. And be it further resolved that in so doing, Mr. Edmund's legacy and Miss Branca are worthy of honor, not only each year in February, but throughout the entire calendar year. And I so move. Seconded by Doug Sinwen. All those in favor of bestowing the award? That carries unanimously two hands up for me. Laura, congratulations. Kirby, congratulations. Uh, I'd like to ask Laura to say a few words, if that's okay, and then um, JB and then JR and then anybody from council, but we'll, we'll begin with, with Laura. Thank you. This is pretty overwhelming, I must say. It's a very big honor. Uh, Diane Sams was such a brave, outspoken voice for justice, and it's really humbling to receive uh, an award in her name. And it's so good to have this recognition alongside Kirby Edmonds, because so much of my work uh, was done in partnership with him. So just, uh, I'm gonna try to be myself. I, uh, I asked my ancestors to be present with me. I think they're in the room. They might be where you are too, because they are not local. <laughs> they go where they wanna go. But I, I asked my ancestors to come in because it's Black History Month. And I thought um, I should say a little bit about my ancestors and uh, what they give me. Uh, my father was born in Louisiana and his father, my grandfather was born into slavery. Yeah, I'm, I'm that old. <laughs> So his name was John Everett Ward. He, he became a school teacher. He was born into slavery, became a school teacher. His own mother had no right hand because it was cut off by her master when they learned that she could read and write. Mm. So the power of education 
and the importance of sharing information runs, runs deep in my family. Um, on my mother's side, her parents, my grandparents escaped from uh, Turkish Armenia around the turn of the uh, 20th century. Um, they were Armenians, they were, they lost their families in the Armenian genocide and came to the United States to get a chance at some freedom and democracy and safety. So I understand something about the immigrant story too, when you're running for your life or you send your children out of the country in hopes that they're gonna be okay. And um, sometimes people say that they would rather be dead than live in slavery or live under oppression. And I understand that, but if these people had not survived these awful circumstances, I would not be here. And so there is something to be said for the resiliency of human beings and our spirit and the possibility that we can heal ourselves and heal others and go on to do amazing things. And that's something that I try to remind myself of all the time. Um, about, about Kirby, um, he taught me so much. He saw in me the possibility that I could do the kind of work that he was doing. And he was super generous with me, teaching me everything that he knew so that we could work in partnership. And I will say that he was very brave and he, we went into situations that I would never have had the confidence to go into by myself. But in, in partnership with him, we could do amazing things. And, it, and I knew that it would be fine, that we would, we would be useful and we would, it would be valuable if I was in Kirby's company. Um, I want to, I want to um, quote Soledad brother, George Jackson. You may not agree with George Jackson. He, he died many years ago. He was a, a prisoner in Attica, a political prisoner. And he said, and I think this is a good message for our community. Settle your quarrels, come together, understand the reality of our situation. Understand that fascism is already here that people are already dying who could be saved, that generations more will live poor, butchered half lives if you fail to act. Do what must be done. Discover your humanity and your love in revolution. I find that very powerful. And the last thing I wanna say is I wanna quote from my favorite song that Kirby wrote is called It Ain't Easy. And this song picks me up all the time. I'm not gonna read it all to you, but it basically said, it ain't easy. Lord knows it ain't easy to see through to yourself. But please believe me when things around you get you down, just look inside yourself. It's all inside yourself. Don't let these bad times pull you down. When it seems like the pain is all you have to know to show you're alive, don't hide away. Open up and find what's inside and feel that feeling. What a feeling. There is no helplessness in my reality. We've got the power to turn it around. It's all inside yourself. Just Look inside yourself. We've got the power, but it ain't easy. Awesome, Laura. Thank you so much. Yeah. I wish he was here. <laughs> oh my God. He would he would be so useful right now. But thank you, thank you, thank you for this awesome award. So and I thank you for Kirby. 
so so well deserved. I can't tell you how. I, I mean, for those who don't know, in the memorial service uh, last week was was eye opening. You know, because he changed my life so much, and I thought, well, that's because I'm involved in government in the city of Ithaca. And anybody who's been involved in government in the city of Ithaca has had their life changed and improved and their eyes opened and guided and steered and prodded by Laura and Kirby. But I didn't know the many hundreds of people who had nothing to do with city government in Ithaca uh, who had that same experience. I mean, the, the reach and what you said about the far reach of your ancestors and the importance of perseverance is just so beautiful. So beautiful. And, and so Jack, I, um, uh, speaking of ancestors, Jack Nelson, J.B. Nelson is here. Would you like to say a few words on behalf of, of uh, the family? Yes, good evening. Um, thank you, uh, Mayor Myrick, Common Council, and uh, Cynthia for reading uh, that um, resolution. Um, Laura and Kirby, uh, to be honest, I didn't know a whole heck of a lot about either of them. And each year that we sit down and we we come together to who's going to be our next awardee. Um, those of her peers, people who've worked closely with her, and one in particular was uh, Cal Walker and the explanation that he gave that many gave, but Cal gave about um, Kirby and and Laura. It was just the right choice. We come together every year and every year seems to be the right choice. And the more and more I listened um, at Kirby's um, celebration, like you, uh, Mayor Myrick, I was, I, I, I was blown away um, at all of his accomplishments and the the cliche gentle giant that he was is amazing because it 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 takes courage to do what he does and to do what the both of them do and like you said Laura to sometimes you would have thought it'd be difficult to do it by yourself <laughs> and I, I can empathize with that. Um, not that I've had many situations like that, but I can just imagine when you have to go into a room and you have to teach people um, about themselves. But you were both truly blessed with a gift to do what you do. And I am honored to honor you with my mother's award. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. I'd like to also ask J.R. Claiborne to say a few words, who's the organizing force behind the award. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you to Council. Um, I'm not quite sure what I can say to add to uh, what's been said already. I mean, we've got a couple of amazing, amazing nominees here, our recipients this evening. I, I will say that um, each year that I do this, this is one of the things that I, I was a, I was happy to be able to take uh, with me when I left council. Um, it's hard to believe that's almost six years ago now. But um, each year, just to be able to, um, one, to be in the conversations about who's going to be our next person that um, we feel emulates the Diane's legacy, but then to um, find out what I think, I think I know the people, I think I've been involved with them, uh, with Kirby and Laura, I've been uh, right beside them in many things. I've been watching them do many things. And just like you said, um, at the celebration for Kirby, we found out that I don't even know the tip of the iceberg for him. And I've really been amazed also at just learning how many more things that Laura's been involved with. I I'm still trying to figure out how, for all the things that the two of them did as TFC associates, there are a lot of things that they did outside of that. And it's pretty amazing because there's only 24 hours in a day. So I'm not sure how they manage that, but I know our community is blessed to have them. And yes, um, I just see Laura, Laura just reminded me that, yes, I was blessed to be in their first, uh, the first Talking Circles group. 
Uh, and Dan Kogan was part of that group as well. And uh, that's an experience that stayed with me. Um, I want to thank council. I want to thank them. I definitely, we have to lift up the name of Diane, as we're saying, because it's her legacy that we have chosen to try and find people um, to emulate, you know, who emulate what she's done. But most importantly, um, and the past recipients have pointed this out, is that this award is not only uh, can be viewed as a lifetime achievement award, but it's also an acknowledgement that they will continue to keep doing what they've been doing. Uh, no one who's received this award uh, who has been able is sit down. Everybody is still out, they're doing. Uh, we know definitely with Kirby, um, he was working all the way up as long as he could, and then some. I, I was amazed that I was in a Zoom meeting and Kirby was right there in the room. It's like, that's pretty amazing. And just, you know, it's like, who has that type of sac, um, who has that type of commitment to community and to wanting to do better? And I think that's probably the question if we can all uh, walk away with is these are people who um, live their lives in a way that is constantly giving. You know, what is it that we can all do individually to give to our community to try and make um, those, the lives of those around us better? So I just want to thank everyone and definitely want to continue extending the kudos to uh, Laura and the Kirby spirit. I'm sure that he is somewhere listening to us and smiling down on us. Thank you, JR. I want to uh, give an, an, an opportunity for members of council, uh, if you'd like to, privilege of the floor, members of common council to say a few words. I'll, I, I want to add about Kirby that he really instilled in me something I, I still believe in. Like Kirby was here to fight for racial justice, but he knew that that was about more than just, um, well, for example, he knew that urban planning can lead to racial justice or uh, injustice. And he threw himself into uh, making sure that there were more sidewalks that currently existed, that the West End got stitched back together with the rest of the city. You know, that, that there were opportunities to, to vote for more affordable housing in downtown, in the heart of the city, instead of just on the excerpts. And what that means is that not only did he help chair the city's comprehensive planning committee, but there is, it is so fitting. I mean, this award could be given by anybody, anybody in the, in the community, but there's nothing that happens at Common Council. Every month at Common Council, we vote on something that has Kirby's uh, fingerprints in it every month. And this month's no exception. You know, and that plan that you can still find on our website is, um, it's just a work of brilliance. And it was his, his skill and genius for facilitation. Uh, and, and he's a brilliant facilitator. Laura was always a little bit better, but he was a brilliant facilitator. And, uh, uh, and when they worked together, you know, there really, there was just no problem that, that they couldn't help the community solve. They didn't come in and solve it, but they helped you solve it. And it's really um, just a, a wonderful thing. Um, uh, any members of council to share a few words? Yes, Cynthia. Um, it is a great honor and thank you so much for, for allowing me to uh, introduce this resolution. Um, I, like so many of us, uh, first met Kirby and Laura through the talking circles. Um, and then over the years in their work with the city, usually when we're, we're going through difficult negotiations and uh, re-envisioning our organization, re-envision our structure, um, Laura, uh, Laura and Kirby were always a part of steering us through that. You know, if, if service is the outward manifestation of love, um, I'm really honored to be in, in this meeting with so much love in the room and so much service to our community. Um, and I think the thing that, that Kirby and Laura understand is sometimes you need a little bit of tough love. You need to help people get there on their own and lean into the discomfort and, and 
and challenge yourself to, to think differently and think um, how other people are feeling and, and think about your long-term impacts. And with every interaction with Kirby and Laura, whether or not it was uh, in a visioning meeting or in a talking circle, uh, there was always that, that nudging, loving urge to push you to think and challenge yourself and, and embrace um, a different approach, a more compassionate approach, a, a long-term vision of, of where we want to be in our community. So, you know, I'm, I'm just very grateful to be able to honor you both tonight and, and thank you. Step. I think that speaks for all of us. She said in the chat that can't say anything better than it's already been said. So well deserved you, Laura, and a beautiful tribute to Kirby, who I miss dearly. Thanks for your ongoing dedication to our community and constantly lifting up the voices of those who feel unheard. Thank you so much. I take up Kirby's mantle. Pick it up, carry it on. It's all inside yourselves. He told you that. <laughs> I like that. Can you send that around, by the way? That I wasn't don't the know, George. maybe. Maybe I'll <laughs> send it to you. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you very much. And congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you so and much. Thank you. Good to see all of our previous winners here as well tonight. Thank you for being here to support Great. Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Mayor, there are always, quite a few of us who were trying to be on here earlier, but um, looks like as many as who could get back in made it. And so there's many more who are watching on YouTube, all in support of Laura and also in support of uh, uh, Laura and Kirby, and also in support of Diane's legacy. So thank we you. Appreciate we appreciate it. And as always, a uh, tradition that is that is as old as kicking off Black History Month uh, with the J. Diane Sams Award is wishing that we could end the meeting as soon as we finish the J. Diane Sams Award, because it is all downhill from there. There's never... Uh, I think as good, and yet we the the meeting must go on. So um, we'll we'll shift now to item two point one on our agenda, which is public comment. Uh, and thanks everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, yes, uh, Mayor, um, we have uh, Town Supervisor Rod Howe. Yes, Rod is here. Report. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Rod is here from from the Town of Ithaca to do the the um, town update before we go to public comment. Thanks, Rod, for joining us. Uh, it was wonderful to sit in on that tribute. So very, very meaningful. Uh, so we're gonna make sure we come to you on a quarterly basis and give you a few updates. Bill Goodman and I will alternate, but if there's any ever time in between that you have questions for us and want us to come and say some remarks or update you on something, please just let us know that. Um, you know, you hopefully you all know that the town of Ithaca is celebrating its bicentennial this year, which means you're celebrating your bicentennial because remember the village was part of the town of Ithaca when we got formed. So happy bicentennial. Do you all feel 200 years old? Uh, and we will be Older. doing some, <laughs> we will be doing some uh, initiatives probably through Zoom. So we'll make sure you know about uh, some of those that will be happening. Uh, you know, I'm just going to mention a few things. Uh, you know, I think much of what I'm going to just quickly mention, because I know you've got other things to move on, is, is the collaboration that does exist between the town and the city. From things like, you know, we're in the process of updating our telecommunications law, and we know that 5G uh, is going to be in the background of that. So we've appreciated that there's been opportunities to do some learning together about 5G uh, and we'll continue to do some of that. I think that you're waiting for us to uh, adopt a short-term rental law. Uh, it's, it's gone on much longer than we had anticipated. Uh, the new goal seems to be June. We're hoping to have something before the town board in June for short-term rentals. Uh, Community choice aggregation. I, if you don't know yet about community choice aggregation, I believe that uh, there's some upcoming presentations. Uh, so the council will learn more about community choice aggregation. It fits in squarely with Green New Deal. 
It has all to do with energy choice, renewable energy, hopefully getting better prices for energy. I'm spending quite a bit of my time on community choice aggregation because we're hoping that many municipalities uh, in the county will decide to join forces and uh, focus on, some of this won't mean anything to you probably, CCA 2.0 with an eye towards CCA 3.0. Uh, so Seth has been participating in some of those meetings, so stay tuned on that. You know, if the city and the town alone join forces, that starts to bring in a, a sizable population, but we know that other municipalities in the county are interested as well. We're appreciative that now we're embarking on a partnership with you around historic preservation. So we've contracted uh, for some of Brian McCracken's time to help us uh, look at what are the resources in the town that we want to protect? And is, are there possibilities for joining forces with your Landmarks Preservation Commission? So we've laid out, uh, we've worked with Joanne Cornish and Brian to lay out a process to see where we end up. We don't know where we're gonna end up, but um, we're excited that we're gonna be looking at some potential collaboration around historic preservation. Uh, Bill tells me that, uh, so we're, we're starting our deer management program again, and I believe that there's some city property involved. So thank you uh, for being uh, part of that deer management program. Uh, Bill and I will be meeting with Dan and the mayor, I think sometime toward the end of February. It's helpful for us just to circle around, just a heads up to uh, Dan and the mayor that I think we're gonna talk about that gun range again. So you're, you're forewarned about that. Uh, we do have two board members who will uh, be, this will be their last year, they're not going to seek a re-election, so that's T.N. Hunter and Pat Leary. We know that you're going to have some of your own uh, new members on council, uh, so and that's a good thing. So we're, we're looking forward to see who ends up uh, on town board starting in 2022. That bridge to nowhere, uh, Gateway Trail. So we uh, have put out to bid doing some work down in that area. The bids came in much, much, much higher than we were expecting. So the town board is gonna look next week to see if we still can move forward on a higher bid to do some of that work down near the Buttermilk Falls area on the Gateway Trail. Um, that's really it. I just wanted to mention a few things. We appreciate the opportunities to learn from each other, uh, to do collaboration. Uh, so I'll see if there's any quick questions for me, uh, but I do know that you have other things to move on to. No, thank you, Rod. Hey, always good to see you. Um, yeah, any questions for the supervisor? Yes, Seth. Oh, I'm so used to calling on people at meetings. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't have a question, but I just, I wanted to thank Rod for his role in, in pushing forward the community choice aggregation. He's been really spearheading that effort and pulling together these meetings and facilitating them. And, um, and just a re reminder to folks that we, we do have a presentation at the next planning committee on that topic. So if, um, if anybody's interested, you know, outside of the, the planning committee members, um, you should attend because I think it'll be a uh, good presentation from Terry Carroll from uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension. Thanks, thank you. Yes, Doug. This is, this is not a question, but just while Rod is still here, I wanted to like, publicly thank Bangs and Police Department and the Fire Department. We had a celebration in Fall Creek over the weekend, a 100 year old birthday. So Bob Nobles, who happens to be related to Rod, that's his uncle. He's my uncle, he's quite um, a guy. We had a lovely, very safe, socially distanced 100th birthday party in Fall Creek, and Rod was instrumental in doing that. He's been a, he's a World War II veteran, a POW, was a volunteer firefighter for many years, and it was nice to be able to celebrate that with the support of our police and fire department. So I just wanted to say thank you and do that while Rod was still here, because I know that's his uncle. Thank you, Deb, and it was very much appreciated, that visibility, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, George. Thanks, Savante. Uh, Rod, um, I know the town decided not to uh, 
join us in hiring a, a outside person to study uh, 5G. Are we cooperating in any way with the town in an ongoing basis on that on that topic? Yeah, there's sharing of information back and forth. I think the reason we didn't uh, sign on with Andrew Capanelli, uh, you know, we, we we did help put together a webinar that happened. Boy, time is just so elusive. Sometime last spring or summer, um, that there's some differences in the ownership of roads and whatnot and right of ways between the city and the town. Uh, but we certainly look forward to um, seeing what you guys come up with. I know that we've shared. I believe that we've shared our draft revised telecommunication telecommunications law. So it's not that um, we're not still sharing information and trying to find ways to collaborate. Thank you. Thanks, George. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Have a good meeting. I'm gonna get Thanks. off now, but have a good meeting. Okay, take care. Thanks for That's joining. So you have enough meetings of your own, I understand. Um, great, so now we'll move to public comment and I'll uh, turn over to uh, Julie and Stan will operate the uh, public comment portion. Sorry, you muted, Julie. I thought, thank you. Uh, I believe our first speaker tonight is Patty Seagard. Okay. Ready? Okay, thank you. Hello, my name's Patty Seagard. I am the organizer for IBEW Local 241. <clears throat> I'm speaking here tonight to try to get our local labor percentage up from a mere 30% to 100%. We've been talking about this topic for a long time and frankly, um, we seem to be missing the mark. For our community to strive, we need to provide local jobs for local people. We can't do that if we can't do that, I can't do my job, which is to get local people good paying jobs right here in our community. Especially if they need to use to utilize public transportation to get to and from work. If we can't secure these projects like City Harbor and the Green and the Green Street Garage project for local for local labor, it'll be harder for these individuals who rely on pub, public transportation to get to work on other job sites throughout our jurisdiction. I would also like to know what the percentage of local labor is um, that's being used on the Arthias project that's going on now on Cherry Street. The way that I see it, when I drive by that job on a daily basis, all I see are out of town contractors. So to me, that says the local labor percentage is probably pretty low. On another note, <clears throat> as a female, in this trade, I am looking for as many minority applicants as I can possibly get, so we may become a more diverse workforce. <clears throat> and in my opinion, in order to get this, we need to have the local labor percentage on these projects to be 100%. We need to put the pressure on these developers to use more local labor so we can sustain our community and employ more of our community members. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Patty. Our next speaker is Todd Brewer, and after Todd will be Deidre Kurzweil. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for letting me speak tonight. My name is Todd Brewer. I'm the business manager for the International Brother of Electrical Workers, Local 241, right here in Ithaca. I represent over 250 members and their families. Of the 250 members, I have 48 apprentices working while they learn in our apprenticeship program at no cost to themselves. The journeymen and our contractors foot the bill for their training. I am also the president of the Tompkins Cortland Building Constructions Trade Council, which is made up of 13 trade unions with over 3,000 members. They too have apprentices who earn as they work. This letter is in regard to the 30% local labor requirement being asked of the Vecino Group on their Astoria project here tonight. While I applaud the Common Council members' intentions to ensure local labor 
on this large project, I am not in agreement with the low number of 30%. I would rather aim high with 100% local labor requirement with a waiver if there is no lake, if there is no local labor available or accessible. While 30% is a good attempt, it will only add to the problem all 13 trade unions have in recruiting men and women who live locally and depend on public transportation to get back and forth to work. 100% local labor policy with the waivers would be a great tool or a piece of the puzzle to help us reach a community betterment goal of getting local community members working in great careers or great benefits. This is a chance to really make a difference. These workers will get yearly raises during their apprenticeships and is a great tool for them to be able to afford a house of their own where they work. These workers will be treated and paid the same as all of their peers. With the union trades, when one succeeds, we all succeed as a workforce and as a local community. Every dollar earned generates more money where the worker lives and that strengthens our local community. I was at an Ithaca City Common Council meeting last winter when at 11.45 p.m. the City Common Council voted to support the Pacino Group's Green Street Project. Before the vote was casted, the first word Alderwoman uh, Cynthia Brock asked the Vecino Group representatives a question. Alderwoman Cynthia Brock noted that, noted about all the community members who showed up and spoke on behalf of one local labor language. Then Alderwoman Cynthia Brock asked the Vecino Group representative, in lieu of all the support here tonight, asking for them to support local labor language, she had asked them, will you commit to paying prevailing wage for this project? And the representative, with no hesitation, said yes. He never said for part of the project. He never said, let me take it back to my colleagues and get back with an answer. He simply, without any hesitation, said yes. I am asking tonight that you hold the senior group accountable to what they answer to all the women Cynthia Brock's question when they, when they said yes to her question on, quote, will you commit to paying prevailing wage on this project? In closing, we do not have many tools to help recruit local community members who depend on public transportation into the 13 trade unions and adopting a 100% local labor language policy with the waivers can be the tool to help many local community members connect to a great career with great benefits to earn as they learn and better themselves in a local community. Please give it a chance. Set some one, three, five and 10 year goals. Check the goals annually and adjust if needed. Thank you for your consideration and hard work. Thank you, Todd. Next up is Diedrich Kurzweil. And I don't see Ian Williams in the group, but if he is here and I just am not seeing him, he will follow Diedrich. Hi. Um, so um, I, I, I actually had Julie uh, forward to everybody some detailed notes, and I'm not going to get into all the detail of it. I just wanted to speak directly to you and get the gist of it out there. So I ask that you read through those notes and answer the question that I ask on them and you can you can get back to me directly. But the main points are that um, I was motivated to come and speak tonight because I was looking at the, um, I was looking at the DDA that was happening for the Vicino project. And I was impressed by how that worked and how there was clearly, and I looked at some like old information, old articles, old, um, interviews about, and I could see that back to something like November 2019, there were conversations happening about how the, you know, how the, how that project was going to impact the businesses and, um, you know, discussions and mitigation and working together from the get-go. And it's not ever been that way for me. And so I, I created this laundry list that's in these notes of all the different things that have happened. Um, and, and it's not like anybody's intentionally trying to hurt me. And it's not like, if you look at a, a lot of them are little things that impact me on a daily basis, but the cumulative impact is that I'm having to divert all this attention during a pandemic to just protect my business from things like walkways being blocked and noise making it difficult to communicate with customers and things like this. And um, so it's not every single day and it's not like it's keeping me from functioning, but it's happening and it's hurting my business. And it's just a completely different experience than you're seeing with the with what's happened with the Vecino project. And so I've already had conversations, I've already reached out to people 
And I really appreciate um, Gary and Joanne and Jennifer and Tom met with me last week and we started conversations around this. But it's basically, there's, there's two goals that I have with being just a squeaky wheel about this. One is I just wanna make sure that we, as a city are protecting our small businesses during development. I love development. I think it's critically important, but that we're making sure that we're not just dependent on landlords protecting, you know, taking their tenants and the adjacent business interests, um, you know, keeping their interests at heart and considering them proactively. And um, so I, I think that we need to have better systems um, to make sure we're holding people accountable for when it doesn't happen naturally. And the other thing is in my, in my notes, I say like, what would you do if you were me? What would you do? Should I just shut up and sit back and just sort of let it happen because none of these things are so horrible and others have it worse or should I, should I advocate for myself? And, and if there's anything more that I just wanna advocate for myself and protect my business and keep it afloat. So if anybody has any good guidance for me, um, um, and again, I appreciate the work of like Tom and others at the city to help me with this and just sort of made, wanted to make you all aware that this is still going on. Thanks for listening, I appreciate it. Thank you, Deidre. And uh, last call for Ian, if he is here, I'm not seeing him. Um, so I believe that wraps up our public comment session. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, move to privilege of the floor uh, in response. Uh, I wanna appreciate the, the folks from the trades who are here to speak about the local labor requirement that is gonna be uh, discussed, voted on later on the agenda. Um, I wanna to thank too, uh, Tom and Joanne for facilitating those meetings with Gary, with Deirdre, with Todd about sunny days make sure we're supporting them as best we can as they're, you know, ongoing back and forth with their landlord. Um, any privilege of the floor from the council? Okay. Well, we can move straight then to the consent agenda. Would anyone like to move the consent agenda? Moved by Steve Smith, so second. Second by Graham Kerslick. All those in favor? And that carries unanimously. So we're going out of 4.1, uh, which is, uh, I'll hand it over to the City Administration Committee Chair, Deb Malinoff, uh, recognize Travis Brooks and thank him for being here to discuss this topic. If there are any questions. Well, 4.1 is new. We're doing the one oh, we right. had to That's okay. Right. Okay. My bad. Only one really fast one, Travis. Sorry, I know you've been waiting and then we'll get, and then we'll get to the big one. Um, this is just really quickly resolution authorizing amendments to healthcare flexible spending accounts. I'm going to make a change while I read it and then uh, we can work on it there. Whereas the city sponsors healthcare flexible spending accounts and dependent care accounts plans. And whereas section 214 of the, the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 allows amendments to be made to plans to make their use more beneficial. Uh, to employees and dependents impacted by the pandemic. And whereas the city desires to allow employees to avail themselves of this relief, and whereas amendments of the terms of the city's, uh, of the city's terms is necessary to accomplish it, therefore be it resolved that the terms are amended immediately as follows. And this essentially says employees who participated um, in the plans during 2020 and who at the end of 2020 had a balance, they can carry the balance forward into 2021. Um, the same, if you have a balance at the end of 2021, you can carry it forward into 2022. That employees eligible may make up to two changes in their plan elections at any time in 2021. And I'll read this one in full because this is where the change is. Employees participating in the city's DCFSA may receive reimbursement for the care of dependent children up to age 14 from contributions made in 2020, including from 2020 contributions that are carried over to 2021. Be it further resolved that the mayor, director of human resources and controller shall take such actions as they deem necessary or desirable to document and communicate or to cause the administrator of the city's plans to document and communicate the amendments to employees eligible for participation in the plans and to implement foregoing amendments and make the amended plan features 
available to employees as promptly as practicable. So moved. Second by Graham. Thank you. Any discussion and questions? No, there, this, there was a pair of these that we did at city administration. It's essentially allowing the city to take advantage of some of the changes that were made at the federal level. And we pulled that off because the aid, the dependent age was wrong. And so there shouldn't be a lot of discussion on this, but happy to take questions. Actually, Shelly is more qualified to answer if you have any questions. It's just a very dangerous thing to say in a public meeting, Deb. <laughs> if there shouldn't be questions, it's usually, that's a well, jinx. We will be here till 3 a.m. Uh, now. No, but I, I don't see any questions. So uh, all those in favor? That carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Shelly. Okay, now we're on the new 4.2, 4 formerly 4.1, authorization to enter into an agreement with the REACH project to establish a pilot project lead program within the city of Ithaca. Uh, whereas in 2016, the city released the Ithaca plan, set of recommendations to address the opioid crisis and substance abuse generally within the city. Whereas a key recommendation included establishing a local law enforcement assisted diversion lead program modeled after programs uh, like the lead program in Seattle intended to divert people convicted of jailable offenses to substance abuse treatment. And whereas the city and other stakeholders have worked toward the goal of establishing local lead, but the development had been limited by funding. And whereas in 2020, in response to a DOJ grant solicitation, the REACH project and Ithaca-based nonprofit harm reduction medical practice submitted a proposal and whereas the DOJ selected the city of Ithaca's proposal providing a three-year grant for a total amount of $900,000 in the city and the REACH project are interested in establishing a LEAD program pilot project. And whereas the purpose of LEAD is to reduce racial disparities among individuals entering the criminal justice system, increase the diversion rate for all eligible nonviolent crimes, and link participants to harm reduction focused substance use disorder and mental health providers, as well as other agencies that address social determinants among the target population. And whereas the city is the recipient of the grant and REACH has committed to employ, supervise and train caseworkers and case managers to support the program. And whereas in addition to employing the staff needed to support the program, REACH shall assist city staff in responsibilities to submit and coordinate data for grant reporting requirements. And whereas REACH and the city will be responsible for each organization's respective cost in the first instance, but shall submit for reimbursement in accordance with the grant requirements and the terms of the agreement. And whereas the LEAD program will not require additional city staffing or dedicated city resources at this time, Program expenses are considered part of the city's 2021 budget and subject to reimbursement. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the council supports the establishment of a lead program and the partnership within the REACH project to establish program services, and be it further resolved that the mayor, upon advice of the controller and city attorney, is authorized to execute documents necessary to accept and facilitate the DOJ grant, be it further resolved that the Mayor, upon advice of the city attorney, is authorized to execute a funding agreement with REACH to memorialize the roles and responsibilities with respect to federal grant and lead program. And I so move. So second, second by Steve Smith. Uh, discussion, questions? Great, I see Travis is here. We had quite a lengthy conversation about this at city administration. I just wanna say, you know, as the mayor said earlier, is on the night that we honor Kirby and we have all of those leaders here and we're honoring uh, Jay, Diane Sams. This is exactly the kind of thing that I think that group has been consistently working towards. And I'm just so happy to see something like this. And um, I will let Travis talk about all of the excellent work that he did in, in securing the grant and, and what the next steps will be uh, for us. And then I'm sure he'll be able to answer all your questions. Yes, not and not just the type of project that Kirby has fought for. Kirby actually fought for this one. He's been yeah, in, exactly. uh, on the ground for it to help him design it. Travis, uh, anything you'd like to add? Um, I, I think we covered quite a bit at, at the CA meeting. I, I, I do want to say that um, last week was quite a busy week. Uh, the chief and I had a great meeting um, after which he posted the two lead positions to IPD. 
Um, I met with the chief and the two deputy chiefs on last Thursday. And by Thursday, two um, officers had already put in their, their bid to become lead officers. Um, so the only thing left is for a, um, a lieutenant or a sergeant to put in to kind of supervise the lead team. But we had a, a great conversation. Um, uh, Deputy Chief Monticello is going to head up lead um, over the next few months. Um, so it's, you know, it's exciting to work with him. They're all on board. Um, I actually did meet with um, folks from uh, Children and Family Services or Family and Children Services last week with Mike Ellis and talked about how we can collaborate with the outreach program um, uh, and, and not work in silos. And, and that was received well. We actually have a meeting tomorrow uh, Mike, I, and, and the two outreach workers. So we're moving, um, moving right along. Our um, MOU has been ratified and signed, and um, you know we're we are really close. I think we're looking at the end of March, um, first week of April, to have the caseworker start. So right now, uh, Reach is putting out um, posts to hire the caseworkers. Uh, we're going to do some trainings for those folks and for the officers. So we're going to put that together, but it's, it's looking really good. I'm really excited about where we are. Great. Yeah. Yeah. It's moving now. You know, you think and you plan and you design and now it's moving. Right. It's here. It's live. It's ready to go. Yeah. Any questions? Yes, Seth. Go ahead, Donna. And then Doc. Um, you know, Travis and I had a good conversation about this and, you know, I had, I had some concerns and actually he brought up the two concerns I had tonight, the, just making sure there's no real, um, conflict with our current programming and, you know, making sure that, um, there's really good collaboration with, uh, family and children services around the outreach worker and also making sure that IPD is just, is bought into the program. And it sounds like Travis has, uh, been doing some really good work to set that up. Um, so, you know, I'm very excited to see this moving forward. I did have a, a question about, um, I know that we had budgeted some funding for this. I believe it was in the neighborhood of a hundred thousand, maybe 150,000. And then we've gotten this grant. Um, is the, is the grant going to pay for the entire lead program or are we still relying on the money that we've budgeted? And if we're not relying on that money, what, what's happened to that money? I, I, I do have some ideas where that money could go. And I, I work at an agency that could always use money. Um, the, the, the program is this in year one paid for itself. So everything that we need, we've budgeted for in, in the year one budget. Um, what will change in year two and three um, is what goes to IPD. It'll be less because we anticipated being full in year one, right? So the work that would be, um, that, that the officers would need to do to bring in new clients would be minimal. Um, I would say probably by August, we'll have 40 folks um, in the program. In year two, we plan to bring in another caseworker. Um, so that number will go up. But um, I, I would say that's in year one, everything is is paid for. And then looking at the exact cost, the additional cost for IPD, you know, we'll start to have that conversation over the summer. Um, and 35,000 is allocated to go to IPD, but there's a lot of upfront trainings. There's getting people on board um, into the program. So that will change. But year one, um, I, I hate to say it, but that money is, is, is not needed. And I don't believe it would be needed in year two or three. Yeah. So those funds have been encumbered, They've rolled over year to year. And so what would happen now is they get unencumbered. And at the end of the budget year, um, Steve was listening. If Steve wasn't listening, when he said those funds are not needed, he started listening. And uh, <laughs> you can roll them over to cover any accounts that go, that go over budget. Um, or cover revenue lines that went under. Uh, add next is uh, Donna and then Duxon. 
Uh, yeah, somebody from REACH is um, on the Tompkins County Alternative to Incarceration Committee already. So I'm assuming that that would be the mechanism by which LEAD would be represented on that committee. Is that right? Um, not necessarily. Oh, okay. Yeah, REACH, REACH it, it, it's possible. I would have to um, understand a little more about the committee, but REACH is the um the case working arm of 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 lead so it is possible I, I couldn't give you that answer today I guess no um right I probably shouldn't have put the question that way I guess what I my my point is there will be there will be a representative from lead on the alternative to incarceration committee is that right it is possible yes okay yeah, yeah. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's coming up to me the first time this evening. So okay, I'll talk to you later. All right. Yeah, I, I would, might, yeah, that's it'd be good to to figure out that cross pollination. I imagine there's going to be a, quite a lot of it because the the alternatives to incarceration is a Donna's our liaison to it, but it is a county effort. The county signed on to our uh, lead MOU. So too has the district attorney and a couple of uh, the other county agencies that I think are represented on the, the ATI work as well. So I think there'll be quite a lot of cross work, which is going yeah. to be necessary. It probably would be me, Donna, that would would be on it. Okay, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but we'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I wanna, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I think this is really exciting and I'm, I'm just so pleased that you did this. It's great. Thank you. And Duxon. Yeah, congratulations. It's been, what, like five years since the Ithaca plan was unveiled. So this is a huge accomplishment. Congrats to everyone who worked on it, but especially you, Travis. Um, I did have one question that came out of the CA discussion uh, where you told this anecdote about how a Seattle officer said that someone will commit a crime in front of, of him to get into the program. And I may be curious if there are other vectors into the program without uh, a police officer being a gatekeeper. So some some municipalities, some lead programs have what they call a social contact referral, and it's still through the um, the PD, right? But it's, you don't have to be arrested. So one of the conversations that we've been talking about in the PCG and um, in the CLT is um, putting together the Ithaca. Um, version of a social contact referral. So one of the cool things about LEAD is you have this standard LEAD model that you follow. And then every municipality has, um, I guess it's like when you buy a car and you, you, you get options added to the car. Every municipality can add some options and, and has some, some design changes as long as you keep true to the fidelity of LEAD. And so we are interested in a social justice, I mean, a social referral um, program. Actually at the last PCG meeting, we put together a committee to look at that. So that is something that is on the table. And I think most folks in the PCG, which is the, um, the uh, program um, group, I think most folks are, are committed to the idea of social contact referrals. That's great, thank you. Um, and, and one little thing, have you recruited the members of the, I forget the name of it, but the community group that um, helps coordinate the LEAD program? Uh, the community? Um, it's a peer to the CLT, but it's comprised of community members. I can't remember the name of it. Oh, that is the CLT. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, Graham. Thanks, uh, Travis, again, congratulations, and thanks for um, moving this along. It's, it's really part of reimagining uh, policing and public safety, I think. I <clears throat> recall in the discussion we had at CA, um, so you have two officers, but the plan in the, in the longer term is to expand that to more officers, or how, you know, how does that um, uh, expansion plan work um, for, the, for the years ahead? I don't necessarily know if you need to expand it to more officers. Um, like I said, after the first few months, 
um, you know, your program is going to be full, which, which you which you may realize, and this is something that we'll have to see after year one, maybe even after year two, um, is that it's it's not after you kind of look at the 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 degree of 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 effort that it takes for the IPD officers to recommend lead to be part of that process you may end up training more officers as they come on or existing officers into what lead is. And those officers may um, be able to um, make recommendations for folks to get into lead, but you still would have the two primary officers that would attend the PCG and the operational work group meeting um, and would be the primaries for lead. But that's something to, to look at over time. I do believe that there is a conversation, well, I know there's a conversation to look at finding funding to add lead into the um, Lansing area where the shopping center is. Um, that's a an area that makes sense, but that wouldn't be part of this budget um, and nor would it be the responsibility, obviously of IPD to bring people in that would be a collaborative effort with the sheriff's department. Um, so really just have to look at year one and see how that goes and how much time it takes um, for officers and um, looking at the, the, the possibilities of bringing others in um, to recommend folks from lead. But I believe over a period of time, um, I would say by the time we're closing out on year three, um, we may be looking and be ready for the model that's used now in Seattle where officers by arrest aren't putting people into lead. Officers just through social contact referrals are putting people into lead. Um, I think that's where we would like to go at some point in time. IPD still participates and is still a huge piece of the program, but we move away from being arrested first. And so if, if I was uh, somebody that was a busybody on the commons, for example, and Duxon was an officer, a lead officer, he would come to the group and say, hey, look, um, you know, I've noticed Travis uh, in certain areas, certain times of the day around certain people more and more often. Um, you know, I, I do think he would be a good candidate for lead. Here's why. These are some of the things that we're noticing. And Duxon could make that contact for me in the, in the, the lead group, the, the caseworkers, before I actually get caught committing a crime. Um, or, and maybe I don't even commit ever commit a crime. I'm just, you know, involved in and around. So that's that's where you get to, and you don't have to wait for an arrest to be made. But that's down the road. Yeah, great. Thanks. Great. Any other questions? Are you ready to vote? Awesome. All those in favor? <clears throat> Those opposed? And that will carry unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. Thank Absolutely. you to Dr. Waldman and Amy and everybody at, at REACH uh, who's helping us do this work. It's truly very exciting. Thank you, Chief Nayer and uh, men and women of IPD who've already stepped up to, to participate. Yeah, that was exciting. I was, I was, I was shocked um, how fast it was. I wasn't shocked that we had officers um, want to be part of it. I knew that would eventually happen, but just in the speed, um, I, I was great. I was surprised in a good way. So it's it's exciting because once you once you have officers moving that fast to be part of something, then you know you have people that really want to be, you know, part of it and see the potential of it. So it's exciting. Yeah. And a well designed program. Our experience in Seattle and Albany and with the other cities was that. You know, you had the police saying, no, we like this program more than the community. And the community said, no, we like this program more than the police. Right. They, they, uh, it's a, it's, that's when you know you're onto something. So, all right. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, next, 4.3 now. 4.3 now, yep. Uh, this is a resolution to approve uh, various agreements, uh, whereas City Harbor LLC. New York Limited Liability Company is the owner of property located at 101 Pier Road in the city designated as tax map parcel 1711.3 City Harbor property. And whereas the Guthrie Clinic, a Pennsylvania nonprofit corporation is the owner of real property located at that address 
And whereas the city of Ithaca, the town of Ithaca and town of Dryden collectively own and operate the Ithaca area wastewater treatment facility. And whereas the developers have met multiple times with the special joint committee of the facility and its designated representatives to discuss plans for City Harbor property and Guthrie property development. And whereas in August, SJC adopted a resolution recommending that the municipalities enter into an agreement with City Harbor allowing use of facility effluent to heat and cool a development on City Harbor property pursuant to terms and conditions and such effluent is also proposed to be used to heat and cool a development on Guthrie property. And whereas um, in relation with the developments, the SJC adopted a resolution recommending that we release a sewer easement, abandon in place an unused 30 inch outfall and enter into a replacement easement with developers. And whereas representatives have negotiated the following four agreements, a, amendment to easement for outfall pipe facilities. B, agreement for access to and use of effluent and excess agreement. C, easement termination and relocation agreement. And D, proximity disclosure agreement. And whereas in May, Planning and Development Board acted as lead agency in a coordinated environmental review and determined that there will be no significant adverse impacts on the environment. And whereas in December, SJC approved a resolution recommending approval of the four agreements contingent upon all municipalities approving each agreement and on all such approvals becoming effective, the SJC further recommended the effective date of all four agreements occur simultaneously. And then there are various warehouses that describe in detail those four agreements that I have already mentioned. Um, and so I will pop down to the resolve that subject to the approval of the city attorney and subject to permissive referendum as permitted by law for the approval of the easement termination and relocation agreement that the common council approve the following agreements and authorize their execution by the mayor. And there's those same four agreements contingent upon all municipalities approving each agreement and on all such approvals becoming effective and be it further resolved that the four agreements shall be finalized so the effective date for those four occur simultaneously. So moved. Second by Steve Smith. Any discussion? No, I, I feel like this is uh, Cynthia's moment in the sun here. She worked hard to make this happen. So if you wanted to uh, take to field questions, you're able to do so. I don't know if anyone has any questions. This is pretty cool and pretty trailblazing and something that we hope maybe other cities uh, take a look at. This kind of partnership is really neat and certainly goes uh, in accordance with our um, Green New Deal and some other climate focused initiatives in the city. So this is pretty neat. And a lot of work went into making all this happen. So thanks to the SJC and Donna and Cynthia and everyone. Great. Yeah, Cynthia, would you like to, uh, uh, anything to add? Yeah, this is uh, this pr is pretty groundbreaking and innovative. Um, the City Harbor and Guthrie properties are immediately adjacent to our jointly owned wastewater treatment plant, and uh, the effluent pipe runs through the City Harbor property, and that pipe contains a tremendous amount of energy, uh, basically comprised of the volume of uh, effluent water and the temperature of the water. And so, you know, what really just came out of sort of a, a casual conversation as we were talking about boating, um, and I just mentioned that wouldn't it be great if somebody could take use, make use of this energy and, and turn it into a benefit for a project. And out of that conversation was basically three years of conversation to, to put into place all the pieces needed to make it happen. So uh, City Harbor and Guthrie, uh, we're basically going to tap into that effluent pipe um, in a closed system, uh, take the energy out of that, that water to heat and cool both all phases of the City Harbor project, but as well as the, the Guthrie Medical Center. Um, <clears throat> based on the preliminary numbers, just as a matter of comparison, um, if we were to compare it to the most efficient off-the-shelf system, like an, an air source heat system, 
and, and compare the energy from an air source heat system to an effluent source heat system, the project will uh, essentially save uh, 1,360 megawatt hours annually of energy. Um, so that's about you know 136 houses. <laughs> Uh, what it costs to heat and cool 136 houses. And that's, that's just a fraction of the savings uh, in terms of energy that, uh, that they're gonna see as a result of this plan. Um, so there's a lot of different agreements that were all put together to make this happen. Um, and we have it here before you. Thank you, very groundbreaking. Any other discussion? All those in favor? And that carries unanimously as well. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Thank you, thank you, Cynthia. Okay. Thank you, Donna. Laura was on also while we were doing oh, this. Laura. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Laura and Donna. Steve, are we good with the audit or? Uh, yes, we are actually. Um, I believe uh, Conrad White and I think Leslie Spurgeon should be joining us. I am here, yes. All right, that's Conrad. So uh, do you want me to move it and then their presentation can be the discussion or do we want to move it after? It doesn't matter to me. Um, they can uh, do their presentation and then, yeah, then we can move it. Sounds great. Yep. Thank you. So good evening. Thank you guys for allowing us to present to you. I know this is a little out of the ordinary in terms of our timing, but I do appreciate the opportunity to come before you guys, before the entire board to present our report. Um, I thought Leslie would have been in already, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. So I don't know if Steve has had a chance to, to um, present to you our full package. What we have given you is a, a preliminary draft of our report. It has not been able to go through our full process for actual drafts, so that should be coming within, within the next couple of days for you. But this is what we believe will be the numbers will look like once the report is drafted and sent to you, and officially sent to you. So first thing that we can look at, I will get started with the executive summary, if, if everyone has a copy of that. Yeah, I don't know that they, let me uh, make sure, let me send that to you now. Okay. Sorry, this is all last minute, so. That's why I asked, because I hadn't seen anything come through the email. So that's why I was wondering if we were ready to do this this evening, because no one has seen it. OK. And I do apologize for that. So, so would you like me to continue, or would you like to wait until each of you has a copy available? It, Conrad, you can continue, and I'll send it right to them here. All right. So as, as we go through this, so the first page of our executive summary after the title really gives a, a really gives an overview of what the reporting package will be. Oh, hi, Leslie. O the reporting package will be. So we do have the basic financial statements, which include the independent auditor's report on basic financial statements. And for the year ended 2019, we gave the we have an unmodified opinion on the city's financial statements. Also included would be the independent auditor's report on internal control or financial reporting and on compliance and other matters based on an audit of financial statements performed in accordance with government auditing standards or as we commonly refer to as our gas audits. Um, Conrad? Yes. Were you able to share your screen? Oh, sorry about that, let me. Trying to share that. I don't think I had the ability to share my screen. Oh, there it is. Are 
Yeah, I, it was actually disabled. My share, my screen sharing. It was what, disabled? Oh, there it is now. I'm sorry, can, okay. can everyone go. not see this? Yep. All right, so Leslie, if you would like to continue. All right, so you left off at the gas report? Yes. Okay. All right, so the next thing on the list is the single audit report. And this is the report on federal compliance over each major program that we tested. And we had um, no findings as a result of that. Um, portion of the audit. And as you can see there, you spent almost four, $4 million of federal, of federal dollars this, uh, in 2019. And what we tested was the CDBG grant as well as the, um, the Marticelli programs, the highway, the highway cluster. Outside of the bound report, you also have a couple of letters. One is the communication with those charged with governance at the conclusion of the audit. Conrad, can you go to that letter? The communication, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's good. So um, what's in this letter? It's the same letter you know, that we give you every year. Um, sometimes under accounting practices, we have new accounting pronouncements that were implemented. We didn't have any this year, um, which is unusual. Um, but there, so there wasn't anything new that way. Also, there are accounting estimates in these financial statements. And the, the most sensitive estimates are depreciation, which is based on the useful life of fixed assets. The other post-employment benefits liability, which is your retiree health insurance, which is valued by an actuary. So there's a lot of estimates and assumptions that go into, into that calculation. And your proportionate share of the pension obligations, which also is actuarially determined and includes a lot of assumptions and estimates. And finally, compensated absences, which is based on the number of days accumulated and um, you know times the rate. There are also some footnote disclosures that you might want to take a look at and they are related to capital assets, the pension obligations, short and long-term debt, and the retiree health insurance as well as fund equity. So the fund equity footnote just goes through the various funds and highlights all the detail of what is in in the fun, uh, fund balance accounts. There were no significant difficulties in dealing with management. And I wanna take this time to thank Steve and Scott and all the staff and, and people that we worked with at the city for all their help during the audit. Um, this was an unusual year given COVID. So we, you know, we weren't on site as much. So there was a lot of um, uploading to our portal, documents, scanning, and that sort of thing. So we appreciate all that effort. No corrected or uncorrected misstatements that we need to disclose. Um, that's one thing we don't usually have very many, if any, adjustments um, during the audit. No disagreements with management. Management representations, um, by the time we're finished, Steve will have uh, signed a letter to us, basically saying that we had everything that we needed, nothing was hidden from us or anything that would change our opinion on the financial statements. There were no consultations with other accountants. And this last section um, just really talks about our responsibility, you can go down Conrad, our responsibility with the required supplementary information um, the first paragraph there, we don't actually put an opinion on the required supplementary information in the first paragraph. You know, we do look at it to make sure that it's reasonable. And for the supplementary information in the second paragraph, we audit that in, in um, relation to the financial statements as a whole. So that's the communication letter. And then finally, the comment letter. So if you could get that up, Conrad, that would be great. You know, make it a little bit smaller if you would, ah, perfect. All right, so we'll, we'll skip over all the, the first couple paragraphs. 
Um, this letter is basically the same as it's been in the past. You can keep going. There you go, thanks. So we're still carrying this material weakness about the pro uh, capital project accounting. So this is something that you have been working on for a while uh, and getting everything in Munis. It is a large task. Um, and I think we need to change the date on that because I'm looking at it and it's saying that it's gonna be done in 2020 and we're, here we are in 2021. So we'll, we'll update that year. And I think we did that on another one too that we have to update. Um, fixed asset accounting. So, uh, so that's we're considering that a material weakness because it can cause material misstatements to the financial statements. Um, the other items we don't feel rise to the same level, but we still want to bring it to your attention. So that first one is the fixed asset accounting. Uh, right now, all the fixed asset accounting is done on a spreadsheet. Um, the spreadsheet is okay, but it, it does incorporate, it can incorporate some errors. So it would be better done in the software itself, um, which Munis does have the capability to do. So that's still a work in progress. And then the physical inventory, this is the other one that I saw that we have to change to 20, well, 2021, if, if you still intend to do that, I know that I don't know how much that costs, Steve, but I don't know if that's something that you're going to be able to do in 2021 or not. Yeah, it's, it's probably a 2022 item, but. Okay. Yeah. All right. Then we should put 2022 in this current status. Okay. Okay. And that, and that is it for the comment letter. So when we looked at all of the, you know, the receipt transactions and and the disbursement transactions, payroll transactions, when you did our walkthroughs, we didn't have any issues um, with any of that. So that means that, you know, we think at least from what we observed, we believe that your internal controls are working um, properly. So um, we just have these, these other matters that we talked about in the comment letter um, for you to work on. So any questions about the audit process? or about anything I've covered so far? Well, if there are no um, questions, then I'll turn it over to Conrad and he can go through some of the numbers for you. All right, thank you, Leslie. So we'll start on page two of the executive summary and I will be speaking from this executive summary, not from the entire financial report. This deals more with the fun your funds while the full report deals with your government-wide statements as well. So as we look at the general fund for 2019, what we did see was overall your assets did, <clears throat> sorry, did increase over your prior year by about 27 to 28%. A large increase, a large amount of that had to do with your unrestricted cash. There was a 47 mil, 37% increase in that, some $3.7 million in that. Also included in that increase was about a $400,000 increase in your other receivables as, so, as well as about 10% increase in your due from other governments. Now, these are amounts that were due from both, mainly from Tompkins County, as well as the town of Ithaca. As we go down a little farther, on, your, on the other side, we do have your accounts payable. Overall, your, uh, your liabilities. Your accounts payable did decrease by about 34%. That was, that was different from the 20% increase that you did see from 2017 to 2018. Your biggest driver, however, on your liability side was the due to other funds. This increased over 100%. And your biggest, funds that you have amounts due to are your sidewalks, your sidewalk fund, your water fund, as well as your sewer fund. Also, we did see an increase in the due to other governments, but that's mainly amounts that are due to the, the school district, Ithaca City School District. As we go down a little farther, we have some unearned revenue that really didn't have as much of an increase this year, but that is compared to a decrece of Oh, 17% from the prior year, which was 
724, $724,000 down to $602,000. Getting into your fund balances for your general fund, the first category we have is your non-spendable. Your non-spendable is made up of your inventory and your prepaid expenses, which are both assets. The total of these, which is the 1.2 million, is actually brought as your non-spendable fund balance of that 1.2. As we go, to full, go down, we do have the capital reserve, which stands at about 363,000. And then we get into your assigned amounts. So that in including things such as the amount that are appropriated for next year's budget of 684,000, you encumbered about $1 million this year compared to about 627,000. Your workers comp stayed the same. Your insurance slightly increased and then we also include in the assigned fund balance, the amount that is due from the, the deficit that we have been tracking in the refuse and garbage fund. That is about $383,000. And the remainder, the catch-all for, for fund balance is your unappropriated, which stands at about 5 million. That's an increase of about 13% over the prior year, of some $500,000, $600,000. So as we go forward, we'll take a look at your revenues and the expenditures for 2019 compared to 2018. Your drivers as would be expected would be your real property taxes and your sales tax. Both in total took up about 65% of your total revenues for, for the year. And they both did increase over the prior year. So, um, your real property taxes, taxes did increase by about 2.3%, while your sales tax increased by about 3%. The biggest increase percentage-wise we saw was your departmental income. And I believe that has something to do with your fire protection services revenue. That increased some 15%. And that itself is the third largest driver of your revenues at about 10%. As we go down, we see the other items have really stayed similar. There are some smaller amounts that did change quite a bit, but not really anything that drove your overall revenues, which we did see an increase of about $2.5 million or 4.4%. Going down to your expenditures, your expenditures overall increased 3.1%. So between your revenues and expenditures, you saw a greater increase in your revenues than you did over your expenditures over the prior year, which is good to see. Your biggest, your biggest expenditure line item that we do have is your employee benefits. That represents about 30% of your total expenditures for the entire year. After that, we do have your public safety line item, which, <clears throat> came in at about $15 million. It was a decrease from the prior year. And I, there were some amounts within the police line items that did decrease, I think, in, the, in your personal services that did decrease over, your, over the prior year. Conversely, on the other side, we did see an increase in your general government support of about 14%. 14 that had a lot to do with the judgment and claims line item. So overall, your ex, you did have an excess of your revenues over your expenditures of about $1.4 million that brought your ending fund balance within the general fund to 10.6 million. Now going forward, we do, we do include a, <clears throat> a compare, comparison of your budget to your actual amounts on a yearly basis. So for your revenues overall, you had a, you had a positive variance of $1.2 million saying you brought in more money than you had expected through, for your, through your budget. On the other side, your, through your expenses, you budgeted for $61 million worth of expenses, but you only, including your, your actual expenditures as well as the amounts that we're encumbered for, you are actually, you have a positive variance of about $705,000. So versus the budget, you did better than expected expected. As you can see in 2018, we you did have you did also have a positive variance, but not as big as you did in 2019. You only had about $57,000 under budget. 
as we go forward, we'll take a look at the water fund next. Now, overall, your, your assets did also increase in your water fund by about $200,000, a little less than $200,000 or about 4% of your fund. Yes. Excuse me. Can you? Um, oh, sorry. Page down. Sorry. Is that better? Sorry about that. Yeah. Yep. So some of the highlights that we have in the water fund are there was no unrestricted cash for the year. There was a overdraft. Um, that we actually put into the accounts payable line item, which is why you see such an increase in your accounts payable line item. What was left in the cash line item was the, the amounts that were restricted for your capital reserves. What we also did see was an increase in the amounts that are due from other funds. We have amounts that are due from both the general fund and the, and the, capital, and the capital projects fund. Also included, we have some other receivables, which increased over the prior year by about 7%. And that has to do with the water rents as, as the charges were increased over from 2018 to 2019. As we go below, the liabilities did, um, did increase as well over the prior year by about 46%, which is less than the 92% that it increased from 2017 to 2018. And Conrad, that yes. and the liabilities increased because of that cash. Yes. Yes. Which, if you look at the net due from other funds, you know, that's really why there is that negative cash. Yes. As we go below, we take a look at the assigned fund balance. Now, also once again, we have this amount which is included for the for the subsequent year's budgets, as well as amounts for insurance, the encumbrances and the unappropriated, unappropriated fund balance. As we go down and we take a look at the revenues and the expenditures for the water fund in 2019. Overall, there was also an increase here of about $700,000 from 2018 to 2019, which, which, your, which with your biggest driver being your departmental income, which includes your water meter sales. This accounts for roughly 90, 99% of your total revenue within the, within the water fund. And it increased to 11% over the prior year. And once again, that has to do with the increase in, char in charges for the year. Going down, taking a look at your expenditures, your expenditures did increase to six point three million dollars, the biggest driver, the biggest line item we have there is actually your home and community service, which includes all of the expenses, excluding a, a small amount for your general government to support your employee benefits and your debt service. Now this, in, now this amounted to about forty six percent of your total expenditures, and it increased about ten percent over the prior year, and a large reason for that increase was due to increasing expenditures in both their water purification and transportation services in the, and, and water, transport, water transportation within the fund. So overall, we did see a decrease in the fund balance to 4 million, from $4.1 million over the prior year. And I should say, um, so that, that loss is actually less than what you had appropriated for 2019. You had appropriated 328,000. So you actually, you know, would have had a loss of 328,000 if you had been right on your budget. So this is an improvement over your budget. Thank you, Leslie. Yep. Going down to your sewer fund, your sewer fund we also did see a slight increase in your total assets. A lot of the, what we saw was your cash increasing slightly as well as your amounts that are due from other funds increasing as well. And that's the same as the water fund. These are amounts that are due from the, both the general fund and the, the capital fund. The general fund oh, I, was about $1 million in amounts due to the water, the sewer fund. 
and the capital projects fund had about three hundred thousand dollars in amount to do to the to the sewer fund your other receivables did increase as well um these are all basically your sewer rents there was no real difference or real change significant change from prior year there was not a rate change included in sewer compared to the water like we saw in the water as we go below we'll take a look at your liabilities a lot of your liabilities um your liabilities overall went down and that is really due to the amounts that were settled up with other funds for your due to other funds that was I believe that was with the capital fund. There were amounts of set settled up between those two funds specifically. As we go a little further down, we have this amount, which is unavailable revenue, included in our deferred for deferred inflows of resources. That is amounts that we have that were deferred. There were January amounts that were deferred at year end. So that was an increase of about three percent over the prior year. As we go. Below, we can see once again the non-spendable fund balance for the for the inventory and your and your prepaid expenses. Your capital restricted fund balance of about two point five million dollars. The amounts appropriated once again one million dollars. Your encumbrances eighteen thousand. Insurance and your unappropriated fund balance. As we look forward at your your revenues and expenditures for the sewer fund. Overall, there was a decrease in your total revenues and that had a lot to do with the sewer rents. Sewer rents were actually down 2.2% over the prior year. And as that takes up about 90% of your total revenues, really what we see there has an effect on your total revenues for the year. As we go below your Expenditures, once again, the line item of home and community services takes up the major portion, which takes up about 62%. And there, we saw an increase of about 9% 9 this year, and that had a lot to do with stewardship treatment and disposal. There were some increased expenditures in those line items, in those accounts that we, that we saw overall for the account. Overall, your expenditures did increase by 6%. So, so at the end, we had a, fund balance of $6.9 $6 million compared to a beginning fund balance of 6.5. So we did see an increase of about $374 over the prior year. Lastly, we will speak about the solid waste fund. The, in the solid waste fund, there are no amounts that we actually show as cash because as in the water fund, there, these are amounts that are actually recognized as accounts payable due to overdraft. So what we have in the assets of about $91,000 does not really, it really does not include any cash whatsoever. So there was no significant change compared to your other funds, but we did see some change in your due from other funds of about $25, $25 million over the prior year. Your once again, your accounts payable slash overfund is overdraft is really your negative cash, and that had steep did decrease from the prior year up by about 12 percent. You had been carrying a balance in the last two years, 18 and 17, of north of 400,000, so that is decreasing. And your due to other funds actually increase. I think general fund had some 47,000 dollars of that total balance. Once again, we get into your fund balance accounts. And like as we as I stated before, this amount is what we assign for in your this amount of 383,000 is what we assign for in your in the general fund. Now on the revenue and expenditure side, we see your main driver, once again, is your collection fees. Your collection fees increased by 25% over your prior year. So to give you 535, I don't think it's been years since about 2014, since you've been over two, over 500,000 in terms of collection fees for, for the city. So as we go down the expend, on the expenditure side, so overall revenues did increase by about 25%. And your expenditures actually only increased by about 5%. So we did see a major increase of your revenues over your expenditures. 
in, ter in, in terms of a year-over-year -year balance. Your home and community service, once again, was your biggest driver at about 394, really not that much different from your $384,000 balance in the prior year. So overall, your deficit in the, in the solid waste fund went from 431,000 in the prior year down to 379,000 in the current year. Leslie? You're, you're muted. Sorry. Um, yeah, I don't have anything to add on that. Does anyone have any questions? Comments? Yes, yeah, Cynthia. And then Graham. Pardon me? Sorry, I, I have Cynthia and then Graham. Sorry, it took me a second to, uh, to unmute. Um, thank you for the presentation. I really appreciate you walking us through this. Um, thank you also, Steve, for sharing all the documents with us. Um, obviously, we haven't had a chance to look at it or digest it, so it is a lot to uh, receive all at once. Um, I just wanted to go back to, uh, I believe, page three of the, the executive summary. And Conrad, you were looking at the cash and cash equivalents, the unrestricted, where it jumped from 6.9 to 10.2. Um, yes. So it's page three of the PDF general fund. Um, and so, you know, obviously we have this interfund transfer of a little bit over $2 million. Uh, you had associated that with the sidewalk fee. Steve, am I remembering this correctly? This is in part um, part of the stormwater fee. And we had planned then in, two, in 2020 to hire uh, an additional streets crew. And so would you associate this with, with that fund rather than sidewalk? I mean, I would think that sidewalk we would tend to encumber those funds as they come in immediately. There wouldn't have been a lag because we contract that out, but there had been a plan um, associated with the increase in stormwater fees for commercial properties uh, then with a hiring of a crew. Am I thinking about that, that jump properly here? Uh, yeah, well, actually, I mean, it's a combination of things. Um, sidewalk has a lot to do with it. And we wouldn't encumber those funds until we have the actual contract in place. And a lot of it has to do with the timing of expenses, especially in, in sidewalk in stormwater as well. So it's, it's a combination of a number of things, but that has some, some part of it. It is such a sizable amount. It, it would be helpful to have a, a better idea of, of how that, that $2 million is attributed. Uh, great. Uh, Graham. Uh, thanks. I, this probably is a question for Steve rather than the auditor. So I'm looking at page uh, four of the PDF. This is the general fund, the fund balance. So at the end of 2019, I mean, that went up quite a bit, nearly um, <clears throat> $1.4 million. So I, I'm assuming that we've dipped into that for 2020, but um, I just wanted to kind of question that because obviously every budget is a challenge. Um, when I see that fund balance increasing, and I know you, you have a percentage there, but I'm just um, surprised that it went up by that much, um, I guess, in 2019. So... Can you just comment on that, Steve, in terms of the level that we should be looking at in terms of, you know, I know you have to cover cash flow and stuff like that. So. Yeah, sure. That's that's fine. Um, yeah. So as I've mentioned before, we had a very good 2019 and uh, going into 2020, we were very, I mean, much stronger financially than we had been previously. Um, I mean, you can see our fund balance growing a bit, but last year it grew um, more than normal because of a, a number of factors, but including, uh, you know, we had increases in mortgage tax and sales tax and some expenses that were under budget. But um, 
going into 2020, we were much stronger than we had anticipated. Uh, and that was a good thing because we're going to need that as 2020 activity will be much weaker than we anticipated. So if you take the two years, they're going to, I don't think our deficit for 2020, which we don't have officially finalized yet, but it won't be quite as big as that a million four uh, increase that we saw in 2019, but uh, certainly it will be significantly uh, a significant deficit that will not totally wipe out the two years, but will be close, if that makes sense. It, it does make sense. It's unfortunate, but it does make mm -hmm. sense. So thanks. Yeah, it is unfortunate, but uh, like I, like I've said before, we're we're we were we were pretty in good, really decent shape coming into 2020, and our first quarter was actually very good uh, related to sales tax, and then of course COVID impacts have really made a difference there. Okay, thanks, Steve. And I would say, from my perspective, Conrad, if you could go up to um, page three. <clears throat> You know, when I look at this, I see you're unassigned at five, five million. And if you add the encumbrances, because the encumbrances of a million there are going to be used um, for the, the subsequent year's budget, you're talking about approximately 10% of your expenses that you had. So in funds available to you that aren't earmarked. <clears throat> that's about 10% of your, of your budget, which is not, I mean, it, it's, it's fairly healthy, but it's not overly, I don't think it's, it's too much. And GFOA recommends the government finance officers association recommends um, about 15%. So I don't think you were carrying a, a hefty fund balance at the end of 19. Five. No, and in fact, uh, we were just recently re-rated by Moody's for our, our bond issuance coming up in February, and one of the things they mentioned, uh, and they had, they had 2019 data, is that our reserves are not high enough. So um, those are the concerns that they continue to have. So even though we had a very good year in 2019, uh, it's still not putting us into... Um, it keeps us where we are, but it's not getting us into a, you know elite category as far as finances are concerned. Right. Yes, yeah, Cynthia. Um, thank you. So you know, obviously here we have the general fund, we have the water fund, the sewer fund, and the solid waste fund. Um, will we receive an audit at some point with regards to the sidewalk fund and the stormwater fund? Uh, those funds are in the bound book. So the, I, don't, I don't know what that means. Oh, I'm sorry. In the large document that I, I guess you got the financial report itself. Yeah, and they're they're in the largest the largest attachment that I sent, Cynthia. Oh. So they would be the largest. They're so they're part of that larger financial um, report. It's called the draft financial report. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Why don't you? Yeah, I believe. So. Why don't you get? Yeah. The Can eighty-nine page report. Okay. Yes. So yeah. it is a non-major. We consider it a non-major fund because it's small. So it's in the back. It's in a combining schedule. Conrad, can you try to get down to that? Oops. I think you. Oh, there you go. Page so here's the, the balance sheet, and you can see the sidewalk and the stormwater. Yeah, I guess I'd ask if, if there are any direct questions. Is it's uh, we're getting on we're about two and a half hours into the meeting, and and, and quite a few items left on the agenda. Okay. Um, so ask if there's any direct questions about the audit uh, before we move to vote. Yeah, I would, I would just tell council, I know it's, it came at uh, a late hour and I'm, I apologize for that, but if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me and I'll be happy to walk you through um, any of the numbers. Yeah, and it uh, comes on the heel of many years of sound financial, not just stewardship from 
Steve's office, but of sound financial reporting. I mean, audit after audit of, of uh, doing a good job. Just a uh, last question. So by voting for this, are we accepted it? Are we accepting it as finished or will this document continue to be revised? It will. Um, I don't expect any major changes by any means, but it, it has to go through proofing and second partner review. So there'll, there'll probably be tweaks to it as a result of that review. Okay, so, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, would anyone like to move the audit? Moved by Deb, is there a second? Second by Doug. Um, all those in favor? And that carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you both. Really appreciate all the work and obviously the presentation tonight as well. Um, thank and you. thank you, Steve. Really appreciate yes. it. And thank, thank you. you. And thank you. Thank for you, your Leslie and Conrad. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. A pleasure. Cool. Take care, everyone. Take care. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, next is Report of City Controller. Okay, well, thanks. And uh, again, I apologize for the late, the timeliness of that. It's, uh, it's part of our ongoing environment that we're working with now. It's, uh, it's been super crazy, but I'll be quick. Um, we're working on 2020 year end activity um, and opening 2021. So we're very busy with all of that activity. Just a few updates for you. Uh, we're working with FEMA on an application for reimbursement of some eligible expenses. Well, I'll have more on that as we work through that process, but we're kind of just in the early stages of that. So hopefully we'll get some partial reimbursement for some of our expenses that we had related to COVID. Uh, in addition, uh, the sales tax, our sales tax for 2020, we still have one payment left. Uh, we are currently estimating that uh, we will collect around $13,265,000 for 2020. Uh, this would be off budget by about $2,350,000 uh, from our original 2020 budget. For comparison's sakes, uh, we collected $15,472,000 in 2019. So uh, as I mentioned, we were off to a great start in 2020 with sales tax revenues and COVID really impacted those numbers as we move throughout 2020. Uh, now that the students are returning uh, and lower COVID cases and the vaccine is starting to get allocated. Hopefully, eventually, we'll see some uh, improvements in our 2021 sales tax collections. Uh, 2020 numbers are still very preliminary. Uh, we will definitely see a uh, deficit in activity, as I mentioned before. <clears throat> Probably won't be in the neighborhood of a million four hundred thousand, as we saw with 2019. Uh, positive numbers, but it will be, it could be in the area of uh, $800,000, $900,000 deficit. So it would wipe out a lot of that positive activity that we had uh, for 2019. <clears throat> uh, we had mixed news from our state aid payments uh, that we received from New York State. Uh, we re annually receive about $2,610,000 from them for general state aid. Uh, in 2020, they withheld 20%. Uh, we have been just notified that um, the state had, has done a little better than anticipated in their financial activity recently, and they will be returning to us in the first quarter of 2021 about $391,000. So instead of taking 20% of our activity, it looks like they're only going to take 5%. So that's the good news. Uh, the bad news uh, is that the governor still is proposing a 20% reduction in state aid uh, for 2021. Um, we did budget for that, so that's a, that's, that's a positive. Uh, so we shouldn't be hurt by that um, reduction. And hopefully if uh, federal monies come, come to the state level in our way that we can, we're able to um, refill some of those losses that we that we are currently uh, seeing from the state aid. And lastly, um, 
we did uh, get re-rated by Moody's. Uh, we have uh, maintained our rating at AA2. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, they are concerned with a few items, uh, and I can mention those. The high debt load that we continue to carry is one of the items they mentioned. The lower reserves, as I uh, earlier mentioned, the COVID impacts uh, were also mentioned as a concern, and also the high outstanding post employment liability that we see. Uh, we have a liability in the neighborhood of $180 million facing us uh, as employees retire off of the city and uh, enjoy the, the benefits that we've been, uh, you know, we, the benefits that uh, we've been giving uh, employees after, after their employment here at the city. So uh, we'll be working on all those items to try to continue to improve upon our financial results so that uh, we can continue to maintain our AA2 because that means that our interest rates for bonding will uh, be at their lowest point. Uh, so I think I will end my report there and answer any questions. I know we still have a full agenda of items. Thank you, Steve. Any questions? Yes, Doc. Uh, so does that $900,000 deficit account for this extra money we're getting? from the, or not extra, but this, you know, payment oh, from the, the, AIM. the state aims. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, some of it is in there, but uh, we'll, it, so our deficit might be a little better than that. But again, I have to wait for all the receivables and the payables to come in. So uh, that's just our general uh, anticipated deficit at this point, even with some of that uh, return of activity from New York State. Gotcha. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Much appreciated. Thank you. Deb, any other report of the chair before we move to planning? No, nope, I think we're good. Awesome. Then we'll go now to planning at economic development committee and all the person Murtaz chair. You're muted, Seth. Still muted. Sorry about that. So 5.1 is authorization for mayor to execute intermunicipal agreement regarding historic preservation staff services. Uh, whereas the city and in, uh, in town of Ithaca value intermunicipal collaborations and partnerships that advance shared goals and equally benefit citizens of both municipalities. Whereas the town is interested in protecting its historic resources as outlined in the town of Ithaca comprehensive plan. And the city has an established historic preservation program that has successfully protected its historic resources for almost 50 year years. Whereas the town is interested in partnering with the city to explore opportunities to enact a landmarks preservation law that mirrors that of the city and establishes a joint city and town of Ithaca Landmarks Preservation Commission. Whereas the town allocated up to $7,000 in its 2021 municipal budget to fund a portion of the city's historic preservation and neighborhood planner position for time used to investigate and advance this shared services opportunity. Now therefore be a resolve that the members of the planning and economic development committee support the city's partnership with the town for the above expressed purpose and be a further resolve that common council authorizes the mayor to execute the intermunicipal agreement regarding historic preservation staff services. And I so move. Thank you. Is there a second? Second by Laura. Uh, discussion, questions? I do see Brian is here in case people have questions. So, uh, Laura? Thanks. I'm happy to support this. And I'm just thinking back to Rod Howe's comments and how valuable it is to have intermunicipal collaborations. I think this is a great example of intermunicipal collaboration. Thanks. Great. Yes, Seth. I had a question. Brian, are, are you soliciting people to serve on this from the town? Are you still looking for people? Uh, I am, um, and Rod is too. So he has been the, the key person for that. He's been reaching out to some of his contacts and um, using their, I guess they have a, a town newsletter. Um, so he's requesting people to uh, volunteer. But if you know someone, I might please share their name. Okay. Well, they'd be Great. horrified if I knew I was saying this tonight, but <laughs> okay. I might have to pull them in. Great. <laughs> 
Uh, Graham, did I see your hand? Actually, I have, I have a question for Brian. Brian, is that State Street behind you? It is State Street. I'm looking at, at uh, Savante's background and it's almost the yeah. same picture. So that's <laughs> pretty actually. exciting. I'm, I was uh, looking at both of them going, wow. A century apart, but uh, almost the same picture. So, oh. I think it's, no, you're right. Wait, or is it inverted? I think it's, the other it's yeah. So Herald Square is where the little temple fronted building is now. So, so it's the other side over here. Yep. Interesting. Um, I like it. That's when the cars started taking over. Okay. Are you ready to vote? All those in favor? And that carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. All right. Um, next up is 5.2. Just get to this. This is a cert certified local government subgrant authorization to apply. Uh, whereas the Landmark Society of Western New York and the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation and the Preservation League of New York State partner with the host community each year to present a statewide historic preservation conference. And uh, whereas the city of Ithaca has been invited to act as the host community for the two, 2021 statewide historic preservation conference, which will be held virtually due to continued concerns related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Whereas as the host community, the city of Ithaca would help fund the conference by securing a certified local government subgrant. And whereas subgrant funds would support a day long workshop by incremental development, keynote speaker fees and honorariums, printing, graphic design and mailing expenses, an audiovisual consultant to manage the technical aspects of the visual format and conference scholarships for approximately 100 attendees from uh, various communities and City of Ithaca staff, elected officials and residents and other New York residents. Whereas the estimated expenses uh, to be funded by the subgrant are $22,464. And whereas the subgrant is wholly reimbursable and does not require a local match, now therefore be it resolved that the members of the Common Council enthusiastically support the city's partnership with the Landmark Society of Western New York, the Preservation League of New York State, and the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation to prevent the 2021 Statewide Historic Preservation Conference be a further resolve that the Common Council authorizes planning staff to apply for a certified local government subgrant in an amount not to exceed $23,000 to help fund said conference. And I so move. Thank you. So second. Second by Graham. Uh, discussion. Yes, that's it. Does uh, hosting virtually get us in line to host physically in a safer future in a brand new conference center for chance? <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely. They, um, they select a community each year. Uh, last year, uh, it was going to be in Syracuse. So the first location that uh, a live can or a in-person conference will be held is in Syracuse. But uh, the hope is that in the future, we will host in person. Okay. Yes, Laura. Yeah, and Brian, I think uh, you commented because we asked this question during PEDC. Uh, the conference is set for November and we don't know how things will develop with the virus between now and then, but a decision had to be made about how the conference would be conducted. And that's why uh, the decision was to go with virtual for this year, right? That's correct. Um, the grant uh, funding cycle, cycle starts in February. Um, and so we needed a decision about whether it was going to be virtual or in person uh, before the grant deadline. And so we decided to go with virtual just to err on the side of caution. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, uh, all those in, are we ready to vote? All those in favor? And that will carry unanimously. All right, so uh, next up is 5.3, disposition and development for the west and center sections of the Green Street Garage, mixed use urban renewal projects. And I'm actually, I'm actually gonna read a substitute resolution that contains some language um, about the local labor requirement um, about which I'm sure we'll have plenty of debate. Uh, so I'm, this is kind of long, so I'm gonna do my best to kind of summarize. Um, whereas in October of 2017, City of Ithaca Common Council authorized transfer of the Green Street parking garage property uh, to support a mixed use urban renewal project subject to approval by Common Council. 
Um, whereas the programmatic elements in that project are a conference center, housing units specifically designed to appeal to, to a diverse demographic, including a substantial number of units to be affordable to low and or middle income households, street level active uses along Green Street, retention of the Cinemopolis movie theater and a public walkway between Green Street and the Commons, at least 450 parking spaces open to the public of which at least 90 will be available for short term parking. Um, whereas the IURA issued a request for proposals to developers to undertake the urban renewal, renewal project and the IRA designated Vicino as the qualified and el eligible sponsor. Uh, whereas the IRA conditionally approved a disposition and development agreement with Vicino for the project, uh, subject to environment, environmental review and common council approval. Um, whereas there were some concerns by the planning board uh, in response to an adjacent property owner and the project uh, ended up uh, decreasing uh, the project by 36 housing units. Um, and whereas because of that change in the number of housing units, um, a, an amendment to the DDA was necessary. Uh, so whereas on November 23rd, 2020, the IRA conditionally approved a revised DDA, uh, which is before us now, uh, which consists of a, at least 181 housing units affordable to households earning between 40 and 80% of area median income, approximately 356 new and refurbished public parking spaces located in the center section of the garage, a 49,000 square foot conference center with street level active use, a 2,000 square foot uh, DPW lease space for the City of Ithaca Department of Public Works, retention of the Cinemopolis movie theater and retention improvement of the public pedestrian connection between East Green Street and the Commons. Um, whereas the DDA governs the terms and conditions for conveyance of the project site and includes a project term sheet and scheduled performance milestones. Um, and whereas under general municipal law, the IRA is authorized to sell real property to a qualified and eligible sponsor subject to common council approval following a public hearing. And whereas the public hearing notice was published uh, in the January 8th, 2021 edition of the Ithaca Journal uh, and resolved that the City of Ithaca Common Council approves the IRA proposed disposition and development agreement with the Sino Group New York LLC for the West and Center sections of the Green Street Garage Mixed Use Urban Renewal Project site dated November 5th, 2020 with an amendment to require the project to employ local labor for a minimum of 30% of on-site work and be it further resolved that the local labor requirement shall apply to the housing, conference center, and parking facility projects as a single combined project, and compliance shall be based on construction labor reporting submitted to the Tompkins County Industrial Development Agency, and be it further resolved that certain exemptions may be granted by the IURA from this requirement based on the following scenarios. In the event that there are no bids or no competitive bids from local contractors for portions of work, the hours associated with those portions of work shall be removed from the 30% calculation. And then the second scenario is uh, the conference center and affordable housing project funding sources already include requirements uh, for minor minority and women participation level, business participation levels that must be satisfied. These funding requirements may cause the selection of non-local contractors. The hours associated with those portions of work shall be removed from the 30% calculation resolved from that the net proceeds from the sale of real property shall be paid to the city. And I so move. Thank you, Seth. Is there a second? Second by Stephen Smith. Um, <clears throat> discussion. I just see there's a uh, message from Jen. Oh, Jennifer's in here. Okay. Uh, or no, are you, she's concerned that she wants to make sure that all the project members will be let into the meeting. That was before we were let in, Seth. Sorry. You're good. Okay. Yeah. Think so. Great. So yes, any uh, questions? Discussion. This is a lengthy discussion, obviously, for months. The uh, late addition uh, at the planning committee, George's uh, recommendation around local labor. Uh, Seth has read that language now into this resolution. So, um, any further discussion? Uh, yes, Graham and then George. So, uh, Seth, thank you. Those scenarios, are they in the agenda package or um, do we have a copy of those, that language? Um, no, I believe that they were, that this, this just sort of came about 
after I, the planning committee. Is there, is there, can we forward that to Common Council? I thought that Nell sent it out earlier today. I thought he did too, but I'm now wondering if it was Common Council was included. Uh, okay. Sorry, I, I only I only sent it to George and Seth because I didn't know if it was going to be, uh, it, it didn't come from the committee, it came from discussions with George. Right. I will send it to Council. That would be great. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, so secondly, I had a question where, I mean, we've heard a lot about um, the affordable units and I'm looking at the the provision there, um, 181 housing units, um, affordable for those earning between 40 and 80% of uh, AMI. So I guess, is there any breakdown of that? I mean, or are, are they all going to be at 80% of AMI? I mean, so I apologize if this has already been discussed many times, but um, I'm not on the committee. So can I get some sense or can we get some sense of, of what that kind of range is in terms of affordability? Graham, if you look on uh, page 124 of your packet, you'll okay. see the breakdown um, under the housing, under the term sheets for the housing component. And you'll see it broken down by area, uh, area median income. Great, thank you Nels, I, I missed that earlier. Page 124 of the PDF. Uh, so I then have George followed by Laura. Thank you, Savante. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I, I proposed this 30% uh, labor requirement at the um, CA meeting, I believe. When did I propose that? <laughs> at the planning committee meeting. And, uh, and we did a 30% local labor requirement for um, the Rimland project last month. I, I'm aware of the fact that this is the 11th hour and that um, this effort is probably uh, less organized than it should be. Um, but I will say that we've been wanting a local labor requirement for several years now. And the Tompkins County IDA has made strides towards that. They've collected data for a number of years, several years. Um, most of the, most, if not all the data they have collected is well over 30%. 30% is a very low bar in my opinion, and also in the opinion of uh, local trade unions. Most of whom I've spoken with about this very subject. Um, so, even though it's the 11th hour, I, I think it's an important move for us to make as a community because with the amount of development that's going on in this town, um, all the local trades should be working. Um, there are neighbors, there are family members, um, there are constituents, there are customers. And, uh, and one of the goals of the IDA and of this city, in my opinion, is to provide good jobs for our citizens. Um, and this includes, of course, uh, young people who can benefit from apprenticeships, young people that live in the city, young people of color, uh, young women. All these apprenticeships become uh, <clears throat> more viable the more local jobs we have to offer. Um, I wanna thank Nels for being very patient with me and uh, for being a uh, liaison between council and um, the Sino group. The language um, that you see is pretty much at the suggestion of the Sino group. Um, and I, I'm fine with some of it. I'm fine with the uh, carve out for um, the requirements that these projects have in terms of uh, uh, women's owned businesses and minority owned businesses. I don't think that first bullet point that talks about uh, Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> no bids or no competitive bids from local contractors for portions of the work. The hours associated with those portions of work shall be removed from the 30% calculation. I don't think that is necessary. I, I really don't. Um, so I would, I would suggest we drop that. Um, but the rest is fine. And I'm curious to hear other members of council's opinion about this. Thanks. I, I will repeat for the record, I'm fine with the 30% labor requirement. I do want to say though, too few of the local trades represent our constituents and uh, too few, there are too few women, too few people of color, too few city residents that get accepted into the apprenticeships in the local trade unions. I've said it ad nauseum, they know my feelings on this. And I think it's shameful and, and has to change and, and end. There's just absolutely no reason for it. Um, I would agree with that. And this, this can push that, can push towards that. Sure. I agree with could, you. Could, could if they, if the two were tied together. Now the two are not tied together and I, I don't think they need to be in this case, but I, I do think we have to be very honest that our local trades are overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly male and, and don't represent the the, um, the city of Ithaca is a community. And, uh, and we gotta change that after. But, but I, I support the requirement in this instance. Uh, does that have Steve and then Cynthia? Rob, did you wanna go first? Oh, I'm sorry, right. did I miss? It's, it's all good. Um, I, uh, um, so I'm, I, I could support the, 30%, but um, out like, I should probably just keep my mouth shut because uh, it doesn't benefit me to, to speak against it. But um, I'm really hesitant to, to support it because um, I think that how we're determining who's local is fairly arbitrary. Um, and even, even if we were to come up with something that was a little less arbitrary, I'm not sure uh, I support the idea that we can employ folks from uh, from Elmira, but not Syracuse, that we should be keeping it, uh, that we should be protecting jobs within our borders and be and be keeping people from outside of our borders from, from being able to, to seek jobs uh, here in Ithaca. Um, it feels very protectionist and it it doesn't feel um, it doesn't feel like it's in line with our values as a community and as, and as a regional hub. Like we, there's um, there's something special about Ithaca. We're an economic driver for this area. We're the best place in the Finger Lakes, in my opinion. Um, and we're a major force and we should, I think there's an opportunity to be generous with um, the growth and the development that's happening here and using that as an opportunity uh, to provide economic benefits to the region and not just to, uh, not just to folks in our city and our county or uh, an assemblage of six counties that we pick around us. Um, um, Cynthia and then Rob. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting comment. Um, and I, I can, I can definitely see that perspective. Uh, I support the local labor requirement at 30%. I support the definition of being residents of Tompkins County and the six surrounding counties. Um, I look at it more as, you know, as was previously mentioned, if you have people who are traveling in from far flung places, uh, that sort of defeats or goes against our principles of, of um, working to have people um, have access to jobs in a place where they can easily commute to. Um, these will also be families that uh, may probably perhaps already have family members that, that work in Ithaca and Tompkins County. And so supporting those families, keeping our city dollars and our uh, funding sources and, and having them benefit families 
in our proximity uh, makes a lot of sense in terms of supporting our, um, our region. Um, and people who are, live in adjacent counties and work here are more likely to come back and visit and partake in the businesses here and, and build it into uh, their community life. So I, I support the, that requirement. Um, my comment had been actually is, you know, I think what we have heard both from previous uh, projects and from local labor representatives is that the 30% objective is easily obtainable, is already, already, already obtained um, with other projects. So um, in which case I would remove the, the resolve that allow for certain exemptions. Uh, I don't see why it needs to be there if the bar we are setting in 30% is so low already. I, I could see if we were aiming for 100% exemption or 100% local labor requirement, then we would need to put in exemptions, but at 30%, uh, I don't see the need for it. Wow. Yeah, the, um, thank you, uh, everyone. Um, I, I also tend to uh, agree with Cynthia's point and, uh, but I do, I, I, I guess the I have a question really. I don't know who is this is directed at, maybe it's Nels, but I, I wanna make sure I understand what those exemptions are doing. Is, is the idea of removing uh, those portions of work from the 30% calculation, essentially making that low bar even lower? I, I guess I don't understand what we mean by by removing it from the 30%. I think it's anticipating uh, some potential scenarios in the bidding process. And for example, the parking garage project has a very large cast in place concrete component. Uh, my understanding is we don't have any local contractors that hire a large number of local employees who do cast in place concrete at the scale of building a parking garage. So that's gonna be hard to meet a local requirement on if you don't have any employee, any, any a major local labor force that does that kind of specific work. So the idea here is to not is to anticipate that scenario and not penalize the contractor for not meeting a percentage when it's not even really readily achievable uh, if there's no local bids that that are responsive to that. So that was the first one. The second one, uh, the bullet related to women, uh, minority owned and service disabled veteran owned businesses are requirements that the grants that are received uh, and the funding support for the conference center, as well as for the affordable housing impose a separate standard. And that standard has nothing to do with local versus non-local. It just says you have to have a certain percentage of these uh, contractors brought into the project. Again, we're a small labor market that doesn't have very many businesses that fit those categories. So it's gonna be very difficult for the contractor to meet that standard with local employees they may be, you know, they may be able to meet some or all of that, but they may not as well. So it's trying to anticipate scenario issues that uh, could come up that would be, you know, essentially a hardship kind of argument. And we're talking about the IRA being authorized to review the circumstances and make a ruling on those issues, not an automatic uh, exemption. So just as a follow-up, <clears throat> I'm sorry if I'm misunderstanding this, but in the first new resolve, the full one, that combines all of these projects together, wouldn't that imply that, you know, if there's a, like the cast concrete example that you use, that if that's a project that might not have local labor, wouldn't the rest of this combined project still allow for 30% and to meet that very low bar, even if you pull out that one project, why would we have to extract that from that? Exactly. That's the reason why they, they're requesting that it be considered as one solid project so they can have a heavier percentage of local labor on the housing component, but a somewhat lower percentage potentially on the garage project. Uh, you're right in that regard. I, I think the characterization that 30% is, is readily available and achievable is, is we have seen historically the, the number the projects that have been completed have hit that number that have been tracked by the uh, the uh, IDA, but it's they're not they're not hitting 85 percent. You know they're 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 in that 30 to 45 percent. I think primarily for larger scale urban projects. So I think we have to be a little bit cautious 
And I, I would add that the IDA is working actively on developing a policy in this area. They've done a lot more research than I have. And I think it's hard to create a policy on the floor when we haven't had an opportunity to really negotiate the issues back and forth with the developer. Um, but I do think that 30% can be readily achievable, especially if there are some um, opportunities to take into account hardship issues. Thank you. Thank you. Have uh, Laura, then Doxa, and then George. Uh, thank you, thank you. I can never remember if my mute is on or off. Um, I and thanks, Nels, for that uh, explanation, and uh, Rob for your question. I support the thirty percent local labor, as has been commented by a few people. That's uh, a good bar. It's a, a floor to be working with. And I agree that there will be some specialty areas of building where there may not be um, local contractors with uh, a particular expertise, a particular skill. So I think the waiver is important. And when we're talking local labor, as has been mentioned, we're looking at Tompkins County and the contiguous counties. Uh, there's been discussion in other places at the IDA, for example, um, about uh, that those contiguous counties, and there may be some people who live uh, outside of one of the contiguous counties who in fact may be close to Ithaca, closer to Ithaca, but it's, it's, uh, uh, it gives us something to work with looking at the contiguous counties and it's being used in other, other areas. So I, I would support that. I would support that definition of the six contiguous counties and support the 30% local labor uh, with exemptions or waivers um, in those instances that have been described, especially by Nels. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, and I would like to add that I, sorry, that I uh, completely support what the mayor has said about apprenticeship programs. I would like to see more apprenticeship programs that um, recruit a broader cross-section of uh, young people for them. Thanks. Uh, Dexon, then George, then Graham. Yeah, uh, I support the, I guess I support the 30% requirements with, but I, I want the exemptions in. Um, for two reasons. So the first one I support because we just don't know what the labor market will be like as the economy ramps back up, um, you know, science willing uh, that there will be more projects ramping up and and, hope, and the, it may tighten up a bit. Um, and on the second point, I was reading today about a lot of cities who employ um, project labor agreements, which on the face of it seem really good. You know, you force developers to use local labor, but uh, there's a big section in the Wikipedia article about how MWBEs, minority and women owned businesses, oppose these agreements because of everything that, that Samantha just said about the lack of diversity in the trades. And so I've seen uh, a lot of projects, um, a lot of bids rather, uh, serving on, uh, for example, most recently, a committee to select uh, contractors to work on the farmer's market uh, redesign and rebuild. And uh, to meet these requirements, they have to go to Rochester and Syracuse to find these women and minority owned businesses. So I think that carve out is important um, and I will be voting to keep them in, as written by Nels. I also had a great email exchange with Nels where that brought up a lot of what Steve said, where it kind of got me thinking about how you know, my, my first responsibilities to the citizens of, or sorry, the residents of the city of Ithaca. And I would sooner support something that targets city residents for apprenticeships, gets more of our residents into that line of work, which we need anyway. I mean, I've read tons of articles in the past few years about the lack of uh, the need for more people in the trades because uh, it's a good living and they're jobs that are often hard to fill. Thank you. Thank you. Next is George and then Graham. Thanks, Savante. Um, I, I support uh, 
the idea that we consider the whole project one project when we're thinking about our 30%. I've got no problem with that. I support uh, what Nels wrote about uh, women and minority owned businesses. Uh, if we can't find them here and they come from someplace else, that that's taken off the 30%. That's totally understandable because that's already been agreed on for one thing. Uh, the first bullet point, I don't think we need. That says uh, if there's no bids or no competitive bids from local contractors, well, who defines what a, local, what a competitive bid is? Does that mean it's not necessarily the lowest bid? Um, I, I don't think we need that in a 30% requirement. Um, in answer to some of Steve's comments, um, our local trades are highly skilled. They're good. They do quality work. Um, when I first got on council, one of the big complaints was in a number of the bigger projects, um, subs were coming in from Pennsylvania who were basically untrained and were willing to work for very low wages. So I don't really see that as a benefit even though we're drawing people from far away. Um, local tradespeople are an important part of our economy. And uh, um, the conversations I've had with the local trades acknowledge the fact that there's not enough minorities and women in the trades and they're eager to uh, rectify that. Um, there's, I think, three uh, apprentices currently in the electricians union who are black. Um, there's a number of women. It's not enough. Um, that's true. But we want to work to create more opportunities for, the, for our own residents. That's part of this. So I would suggest that we keep all the... Um, add-ons except that first one okay i'm going to take that as a motion is there a second to remove the clause that says um that the requirement will be waived if there are no bids from local contractors or no competitive bids seconded by cynthia any discussion on the amendment Okay. All those in favor of that amendment? Supposed? Looks like it'll fail eight to two. So we're back to the resolution now. I did have Graham right before that that motion. Thank you, uh, Savante. Um, so firstly, I mean, I, I'd like to thank George for um, uh, putting this, championing this and, and getting us to actually take some action on it. And also Nels for working presumably with the developers um, and others to um, put this together. Um, because I, I do think it's a good start. The, the um, objectives seem very reasonable. And I also think this is a, a good opportunity for us to, I, I, I disagree with the earlier comments about it being protectionist. I think it's really an opportunity to um, develop the local and the local economy and diversify the, the skills that we have in this uh, community. Um, if these projects are always developed with outside labor, uh, we, we know the cost of living in this area is very expensive. And uh, if people are not able to participate across a range of um, income levels, um, I think we, we're in danger of um, basically uh, not sharing the benefits that we have, as Stephen pointed out, of this community. So I think this is a well-crafted um, uh, introduction of this um, requirement. Um, I, I do see George's point about the exemptions, but I, I think what I would like to make sure is that, to me, this is an experiment, and I hope we will definitely hear um, if there are these exemptions to, this, to these um, uh, requirements uh, based on um, those scenarios um, regarding um, bids from the 
the local union, uh, local um, trades, uh, and also the the grants for the affordable housing components. Because if those uh, are real barriers, then I think we would need to look at those um, in terms of the future projects. But I, I think this is a, a good start to um, trying to basically share um, the benefits of some of these large projects with um, local trades. And I also want to agree with Savante and others' comments about um, really encouraging the diversification of these local trades, which hopefully these opportunities will encourage more people to, because there'll be more opportunities to get involved um, and more jobs for those local trades. So I, I certainly support this as written. Okay. I think we're ready to vote on the full resolution. Uh, Steve, to see you. Yeah, I, I yeah, I just wanted to um, respond to some of the comments. Like my my focus here is, I think we live in a world where we need to be fostering more in, interconnectedness. And when we're deciding that we'll employ people from Portland but not from Syracuse, and people from Elmira but not from Binghamton, I think it's I just don't think that that that, that fosters that. So I, I understand where everybody's coming from with the need to support local trades and uh, find more opportunities to uh, invest in. in Apprenticeships. It's just I worry about uh, trying to shrink our uh, our sphere of influence down. Yeah, yeah, and I, I understand that. I would like to see too a more tailored approach to what's local. I, I do think of Binghamton as part of our local. I just do. I mean, I know a lot of people who work in Binghamton and live here, and and make that commute. And I I don't think of them as going all that further than people who work in Elmira and live here. Um, but, you know, as a standard in the contiguous counties, it makes sense until we can get a more targeted or more surgical definition of what's local and what's not. See, George? Uh, just very quickly, 30% uh, local labor requirement doesn't mean somebody from Binghamton or Syracuse or Rochester can't work here. Um, I'm going to pivot real quick to another topic, which is, um, I know we got one email about this, but I've also heard about it from many people. In fact, I've heard about it for years. Every time Seth and I would go to a Northside United meeting and talk about a new affordable housing project, multiple people would always ask the question, like, affordable for whom? And so I do want to acknowledge that I'm excited and happy about this massive affordable housing project, but also acknowledge that you know, someone who's making the current New York State like upstate minimum wage, which I think is 1250. And even if they manage to get 40 hours a week for an entire year, which is probably unlikely these days, given the way retail jobs um, schedule their workers or the way gig, gig economy workers are can get their work, uh, hit below 30% AMI for this region, I believe. And so I wanna acknowledge that there is a whole and that there are a lot of people who can't qualify for, for even this housing. Uh, but I also wanna point out how difficult it is that we are, well, A, the city doesn't build housing, but the people who do provide housing are limited by this kind of neoliberal tax credit mechanism um, for providing affordable housing when HUD used to just build housing. And so I'm hoping that we see a a move towards the federal government picking up the responsibility for, for building more housing directly and that meets the needs of the most vulnerable in our community. Yes, Seth. I had a kind of jumping on Doc's comment. I had a question about um, just the AMI for the region. So do we know, like, what is the actual AMI for this area and how is that calculated? Uh, that's that's a HUD calculation they track on a year annual basis. It's based on a family income, not a household income. So uh, it really kind of factors out students out of our market, for example. Uh, I believe the the hundred percent area median income for a family of four is about seventy eight thousand dollars, and it's it's basically a county wide number. It's not specific to the city. It covers the entire county. And they measure it by the county. Yes. Okay. Sorry, Nels isn't, I'm looking at it right now for 2020, oh. it's 
if you've got the stats that I mean, I may, maybe I'm thinking of the 80% AMI, which I work with more often than the 100% AMI, but yeah, 80% yeah. 80 is 68,500. Do we have data on to what extent a local requirement changes the affects the cost to the developer um, with respect to both wages and to the cost of tracking and reporting? Uh, the developer is available to answer questions if, if you want to explore that question. Yeah, I guess I'd ask. Uh, Bruce or, or Rick, if you have an answer, I know too that Laura and the IDA have been talking about just that for a long time, and it's, it, it's hard to quantify. But. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll just briefly answer that. I mean, the the cost uh, we we don't know if there will be a cost difference or not, um, and generally speaking, those things can get sorted out uh, in talking to local uh, labor and the regional uh, folks and just figure out if, if we get a number that's higher than, um, than, and it's local, but it's higher than everybody else, there's an opportunity to negotiate that still. So we do have some leverage and opportunity there. As far as the tracking, we're gonna track it anyway as, as a requirement of the IDA. And so I think, you know, the cost of that is, is, is born in part of the project to start with. But, you know, there, there is a small risk that that may be cost more to do that, but we just don't know that at this point in time. Uh, I have Duxon and Cynthia, and a uh, gentle reminder that we have several uh, um, heavy and lengthy items left on the agenda after this one. Yes, I apologize. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Apologize. Uh, Just a reminder. Um, can someone on the project team, like, maybe you can tell us later, and I should have asked this a while ago. And I will ask it of everyone in the industry. Um, like, what would it take to make, to address the, um, the 30% and lower uh, demographic, AMI demographic. Well, what would it take to get, make the entire building accessible to 30% AMI and not um, you know, go as high as, as 80? I'm gonna flip that one, Rick. Yeah, Rick. what kind of numbers and, and subsidy would that take? I have got no idea. No, Doc, that's a good question. I mean, really, it would take vouchers uh, because at that 30 AMI, the income that would bring in, you wouldn't be able to pay for insurance, staffing, upkeep, things like that. So it is, yeah, it's going back to those, I don't want to say the Section 8 days, but it is, it's going to have vouchers tied to the units. Um, one great thing about this project, we've got 40 units through TC Action where the folks are going to pay 30% of their income, but it has that ESHI grant tied to it to pay up to that 50% AMI. So folks may pay $50 a month to live there, whatever. So it's gonna take some kind of subsidy as far as X amount of dollars. I, I can get back to you I, on the fly, I don't know, but it would be a lot. Yeah, I know you can't answer right now, but I think um, now that we are hitting this, and I, again, I think it's phenomenal. This whole project is, is a miracle, quite frankly, because of all the moving pieces. And so I support it heartily. It's just, I think, it, you know, I want us to, all of us to start thinking about hitting the most vulnerable people. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Cynthia. Yeah, thank you. Um, going to Duxton's question and building off of Rick's response, um, and I it included a link to the hub page that shows the, the median family income for uh, the Ithaca metropolitan area. Um, and even in there, it indicates that I think that the government expects that people would be have access to Section 8 vouchers in order to um, bridge that gap between their income and 50% um, AMI for what the rents are. So um, I don't know that it's reasonable to expect a developer to be able to pencil out a project that can support the 30% generally, um, but whatever we can do to increase accessibility to vouchers to allow people to have access to this housing, uh, I think is the, the bridge that we would need to uh, span. Um, 
with regards to the, the vote on the DDA itself, I know that this vote is, goes in conjunction with the following two votes associated with this. Um, I, I will not be supporting it. Uh, I am not in support of the, the conference center uh, for the city and for this project. Um, I, I do think that this is not the proper economic time for us to be entering into a, a long-term financial commitment uh, to a conference center. We, are, we already have a guarantee that we will be making with regards to the parking, which I do think is essential, but the additional lease guarantee that we will be providing of uh, 1.5 million over the next 30 some odd years uh, puts an incredible strain on the city in the time of uh, incredible economic uncertainty. Um, a conference center is targeting and supportive of the hospitality industry, which is a wonderful industry, but it is also an industry that relies on low wage labor, <laughs> thereby then requiring more uh, housing that will need to be provided at 30% AMI to support the laborers who will be uh, getting their jobs through the hospitality industry. Um, so, I will not be for voting in support of the DDA. Okay. Are we ready to vote? All those in favor? Those opposed? And that carries eight to two. Thank you very much. Uh, up next. Up next is uh, just give me one sec. Is this is the um, the local law on the uh, Ithaca room occupancy tax? Whereas on February fifth, two thousand twenty, Common Council adopted a resolution stating the city's commitment to pursue a city of Ithaca hotel occupancy tax and commitment to provide a shared financial guarantee with Tompkins County. Whereas on June thirtieth or June third, twenty twenty, Common Council adopted a resolution requesting that the NY Senate and Assembly enact the Home Rule legislation submitted by Assemblywoman Barbara Lifton and Senator Tom O'Meara to enable the city to implement a hotel occupancy tax. Whereas the City of Ithaca hotel tax legislation passed the Assembly and Senate in July twenty twenty, and in December twenty twenty, Governor Cuomo signed it into law as part of the state tax code. Uh, now, therefore, being enacted by the Common Council of the City of Ithaca as follows, and I will move this as written. Is there a second? Second by Graham Kersler. Uh, discussion. Yes, uh, Seth. So I, I, this might be just a good opportunity to just say, you know, I know that this project, it, it has a lot of moving parts and it's incredibly complicated. And, you know, it started with the need that the city has to rebuild our parking garage and, um, now, I think it's a testament to the community that we came together to not only rebuild the garage, but also felt, figure out a way to satisfy our goals for increased affordable housing downtown and the conference center, which I, I understand the apprehension that, that people have certainly with, um, you know, the pandemic and all the financial uncertainty that the city has been facing. But if you look at the reserves that have been built into the conference center um, and all the due diligence that's been done, if you buy the people that are, are in this meeting right now and and um and i gotta you know i also want to credit tom knight who wasn't able to be here tonight um you know it gives me a reassurance uh knowing that the conference center is not slated to open until 2024 and um we'll be collecting this room tax until then and also knowing that um you know just the other day i read an, an article in the new york times was, that was talking about how um there's a lot of fear and a lot of uncertainty around, especially these new variants that have, have sprung up with coronavirus. But the news that we're getting from the vaccines continues to be really good. Um, that even if there are cases where uh, the vaccines aren't wiping out all infections, they continue to show signs of reducing hospitalizations, which is the really key thing uh, to defeating this virus. So all of that news uh, continues to reassure me. And, um, you know, this conference center, I do believe, will be a boon for our economy and not only the uh, organizations and groups that are um, availing itself themselves of it and, and meeting in our community, but also local groups that will be able to use this space for community meetings. And finally, all the, the local businesses that will be supported um, by the people that are coming to the community to use the conference center. So, 
you know, I just, I wanted to say all that just, and especially to give a shout out to, uh, to Nels and to Jennifer and Peggy and Gary and everybody else that have worked so hard to come up with this. Um, and also Vecino and the project team, uh, just to come up with this incredible, uh, very visionary um, project, uh, which I'm proud to support. And, and I will be voting for the occupancy tax tonight. Yeah, thanks. Seth. I'd second that. And just say that the work that the group uh, that you just mentioned is work to satisfy some of the toughest uh, uh, sets of due diligence. I mean, if you have to convince Governor Cuomo that this is a good idea, the state legislature, uh, the financiers, the hotels themselves, which will be paying the, the rooms tax, um, you know, they, they keep crunching and recrunching these numbers using the best available data, survey data, trends, hospitality trends, and, and I believe them. I think they've done a very good job in making sure this is the right project for the right moment in the right place. I support it as well. Uh, yes, I have Cynthia and then Donna. Supporting this, but not for any of the reasons mentioned. Um, I. I think that um, I want to make sure that the city succeeds and we need to be able to pay the bills. So um, voting for this is a way to do that. Um. Sorry, Donna, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been honest and forthright from the beginning that I'm opposed to the development of a conference center. Um, I really wish that I had been more aggressive earlier about arguing for in the R, that our RFPs include development of a new city hall or a new police station or a new bus depot, all of which we sorely need. Um, if we have the opportunity to raise a new tax, I would I would have liked to, to go to one of those other needs. I I think it's sad that we're raising a new tax that's developed specifically and solely for the conference center. And my conscience is clear because I've been honest all along about this. And my new president told me that I don't have to agree with everybody, but I have to be nice about it. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Thank them. Yeah, I, I hear you on the tax front. You know, we just saw that every every community in the last 10 years that's tried to pass a hotel's rooms tax um, has it's either failed in the legislature or been vetoed by the governor because they won't use the rooms taxes for general purpose supports, things like building a bus depot or a city hall. So they just don't allow the taxes unless it's to fund a, a hospitality related purpose. But I hear what you're saying. I mean, I think if we had more flexibility to, from the state to raise revenue as we saw fit, I think we'd do a better job, frankly, than, than they do. Okay, are we ready to vote on this one? And Mayor, this will be a roll call vote. Great. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Alderperson Brock? Aye. Alderperson McGonigal? Aye. Alderperson Wynn? Aye. Alderperson Murtaugh? Aye. Alderperson Gerhardt? Aye. Alderperson Fleming? No. Alderperson Smith? Okay. Aye. Okay. Yeah. Alder, Alderperson Kerslick? Aye. Alderperson Mollenhoff? Yes. Alderperson Lewis? Yes. It carries nine to one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next. Uh, next up is 5.5 .5, city participation to finance the public portions of the Green Street Garage mixed use urban renewal project. So, this is the last of the resolutions on this topic. Um, I'll, it's, this one's a bit long, so I'll, I'll try to summarize. Um, whereas, implementation of the urban renewal project. Um, identified in the DDA with Vecino is contingent upon securing project financing, whereas the project consists of affordable housing, parking garage renovation and construction, and a conference center. Um, whereas 
the Vecina will finance the affordable housing component without city involvement, but it requires city participation for financing the public components of the project. Um, whereas general municipal law authorizes the city to plan and undertake one or more ur urban renewal projects. Uh, whereas financing for the parking garage and conference center is proposed to derive from taxable revenue bonds issued by the Tompkins County IDA. Uh, whereas bond funding is structured to provide a fixed interest rate with level annual principal and interest payments for 30 years to retire the bonds following an interest only period during construction. Uh, whereas the proposed financing structure requires Vecino to pay principal and interest on the taxable revenue bonds. And Vecino in turn seeks rental payments from leases of the completed conference center and the parking garage to meet bond obligations. Uh, as, whereas as neither the conference center nor the parking garage is projected to generate earned revenue sufficient to retire the bonds, the revenue bonds are only marketable with participation by the city of Ithaca. Whereas the major parties and roles involved in the contemplated financing are Tompkins County IDA, uh, the Asteri Conference Center LLC, Asteri Garage LLC is owner of the parking garage, the Downtown Ithaca Local Development Corporation, which is the nonprofit entity that will le leasing the conference center, uh, and the city of Ithaca, uh, whereas the following city participation is required to secure the proposed financing for the conference center and parking garage components of the projects. There's a city lease from Vecino of an approximately 300 space parking facility with a 30 year term with option to acquire facility at the end of the lease term. City lease from um, the LDC of an approximately 2,000 square foot Department of Public Works maintenance space. Uh, it's a 30 year le term lease. Uh, the City of Vecino Parking Garage Financial Assistance Agreement, a city commitment subject to annual appropriation to pay the bond payments to, to the extent that there is a shortfall from parking lease revenues to meet bond obligations. Uh, and whereas the, the City LDC Conference Center Financial Assistance Agreement, to the city commitment subject to annual appropriation to pay the bond payments to the extent that there is a shortfall from the conference center lease revenues uh, and amendments to 2003 agreements to release MT's bank's leasehold mortgage and assignments of rents held on the Green Street garage premises. Uh, and whereas the projected level principal and interest payments on the parking bonds is estimated at $840,000 per year under current market conditions, and the projected level principal and interest payments on the conference center bonds is estimated at 1,550,000 million per year under current market conditions. And whereas the all in true interest cost in the bonds is projected to fall within a range of 3.9% to 4.2% under current market conditions. Whereas the rental rate on the parking garage, the lease of the parking garage will be established to cover principal and interest payments on the parking bonds whereas the rental rate on the city lease of City Department of Public Works maintenance facility is projected at fixed $13.50 square foot per year. And whereas a new city hotel room occupancy tax will be established and revenues from this new tax are projected to cover the cost of the series bond payments for the conference center and therefore a shortfall from conference center lease payments is not anticipated. Uh, resolved that the City of Ithaca Common Council hereby determines it is in the interest of the city to increase public parking and construct a conference center in the downtown core of the city, financially participate in the urban renewal project to ensure its financial success. And be it further resolved that the city of Ithaca Common Council hereby authorizes the undertaking of the urban renewal project by Vecino and approves the following agreements to support the parking garage and conference center components of the Green Street urban renewal project. I read those in the whereas, so I'll just skip over these. Uh, so I'll just move as written. Resolve that the mayor subject to review by the city attorney is authorized to execute and deliver the above agreements upon satisfaction of the following conditions. Execution of a city Tompkins County agreement to provide 4% of county room tax collections to support the conference center. Execution of a funding and financial oversight partner agreement between the city, the downtown alliance, the Tompkins, uh, Ithaca Alliance, the Tompkins County Chamber Foundation, and the downtown Ithaca Local Development Corporation execution of a lease agreement between the Downtown Ithaca Local Development Corporation, LLC, and Asteri Conference, LLC, uh, Tompkins County IDA agency approval of a pilot agreement reducing the property tax obligation on the public parking garage and conference center leasehold premises to less than $100 per year for the duration of the bond financing. And I so move. As a second by Steve Smith. Discussion. Seeing none, uh, all those in favor? 
and those opposed? And that will carry eight to two. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Seth. Any other any other um, reports for planning? Um, I guess the the one, I mentioned one before. We're going to get an update on the community choice aggregation, which uh, Rod has been doing so much work on, and at P, the next PDC meeting. And also, um, we'll be continuing our review of of the uh, green building policy. Um, which is obviously a big plank in our Green New Deal. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we move now to appointments, a number of uh, reappointments. Would anyone like to move? Moved by Deb. Is there a second? Second by Deb. All those in favor? And that carries unanimously. Um, reports of council liaisons. Is there a report of city clerk? Yes, I'd just like to re remind you that your annual disclosure statements are due and um, I need to publish their availability soon. I'm a little past the deadline right now. So the sooner you can get them in, the better, please. And I uh, just want to let you know that your W-2s have been placed in your inner office mailboxes. Um, if you need those mailed to you, shoot me an email and I'll I'll make sure that happens. Thank you. I'll have to amend mine to show that I bought 1,000 shares of GameStop just in time. Um, no, the things I wish. Uh, report of city attorney. Um, I My only report would be uh, to invite counsel to uh, and, and move for an executive session if you're so inclined to discuss pending litigation. Yeah. And I apologize so, for the hour at, at this moment. Yeah. And there's no, uh, we expect no vote on the That's right, other no side. So we can again end the broadcast of the meeting once we enter executive session. Yep. Okay. Is there a motion to enter executive session to discuss pending legislation? Moved by Litigation. Laura, second by Duxon. Litigation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moved by Laura, second by Duxon. All those in favor? And that will carry unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Steve. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.